Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the second day of the webinar on uh, ethanol economy. Yesterday we had a uh, we had an exciting time and a wonderful time and an overview of the uh, ethanol economy during the inaugural session. And then we had a, a session on the technological challenges, uh, wherein the experts had presented their study and the trials that were conducted on ethanol. And a lot of technical learnings we were, were shared uh, yesterday in these sessions held uh, yesterday by our experts. And uh, uh, yesterday's presentations are also available on the handout section uh, on your right. Uh, we have the handouts available. If, uh, if anyone couldn't attend the sessions yesterday can have a, a look of the handouts which are available there. And uh, you may also download it. And uh, after that, we also had an exciting panel discussion and uh, we were uh, having various experts who discussed different aspects of ethanol economy and uh, how the roadmap uh, uh, has to move ahead. And we uh, all these directions and deliberations were done in the panel discussion yesterday. And uh, uh, in case you couldn't attend the sessions, you can also uh, download our recorded sessions through uh, our um, the sessions available on Aspire portal uh, on the website aspire.icad.in or you can also uh, download it from our LinkedIn page Aspire underscore ICAT and uh, you'll be able to have a look at our uh, webinar recordings. So we will uh, begin the uh, third session of the webinar and uh, the topic is the international experiences on ethanol blended uh, petrol or diesel uh, and uh, today for the session we have uh, eminent uh, international speakers with us and uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we are grateful for your presence today and uh, for moderating the uh, session uh, uh, may i may we have an eminent uh, a speaker with us and he is uh, he has he's a passionate uh, person in ic engines okay. and in in the major uh, automotive oems he has been working he started his career with bajaj uh, auto and he worked on the uh, kawasaki forest motorcycle engine localization program and uh, and later on forest champion motorcycle program exclusively for 87 a kilometer per liter and he developed the uh, developed and released for production and uh, which has turned bajaj into a, a very big two-wheeler company today uh, then he worked on the farm equipment sector and uh, with mahindra and mahindra for seven years and very uh, developed platforms uh, for uh, for engines and also initiated six cylinder engine and thereafter he moved to Tata Motors and he developed the first common rail engine for SUV application. And uh, he also established advanced engineering group for engines and made initiatives for biodiesel buses with IOC and successfully run transportation buses with P10 biodiesel uh, in his career in Tata Motors. And he also led a lot of uh, programs with IIT Chennai especially on CNG and LPG programs run on hydrogen engine. And uh, thereafter he joined uh, Ashok Leyland and he, uh, there he developed a, a three cylinder, uh, uh, those uh, mini truck and for which the sale crossed more than one lakh uh, numbers. And uh, there is also a CNG uh, vehicle, which is uh, on the same platform. So at present, he is heading the engines group and uh, applications on trucks, powers, uh, power solutions and passenger versions as vice president of engine development at Technical Center at Ashok Leyland. So let us uh, give a warm welcome uh, and uh, applause to Mr. Sadgopalan Krishnan. So he'll be moderating the session today. May I request Mr. Sadgopalan Krishnan to uh, take the uh, session forward. Over to you, sir. Very, very good morning. Uh, very sorry, I'm not able to open the webcam, so you're not able to see me. 
if i get some share i can share my thoughts uh, right now so thanks for inviting me and thanks for organizing a great inspiring program on ethanol economy and it is in the right time we are organizing this uh, ethanol program where <coughs> one minute sogada i accept that it's not coming but uh, am i audible yes sir we can hear you i think okay. there is some technical so will, problem on the some webcam. technical problem on webcam no issue i'll be talking don't worry okay 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 no anyhow so 10 minutes i will talk then i will introduce one by one speakers thank you anyhow we had yesterday <laughs> the rehearsal however when there are many people there is a problem in the network maybe very sorry for that anyhow this is in a right time we are organizing this seminar and that too we would like to have international experience with us uh, now uh, why ethanol right now that is because of only these reasons uh, non renewable and it will pollute less carbon neutral as well as in energy independence for our country and less polluting that's the main reason we are going and if you take either production capacity or local emissions or co2 reduction or vehicle pollution how to handle we all are practiced yesterday dr malhotra was saying that since 1975 he has been working I had a chance to work with him in 2010 E10 car testing, Indigo car testing when I was in Tata Motor. So we always identified that fuel handling systems, wherever plastic and rubber component, it needs verification and modifications for ethanol compatibility. As well as for a 10% ethanol, you will get very good HC and CO reduction. However, NOx will be slightly increasing. So in today's condition, uh, or RON also will be increased. It's an oxygenate. It will help combustion. So that's why ethanol is preferred. However, car, uh, even decarbonization, carbon to hydrogen ratio, though it is hygroscopic, hygroscopic can be handled. If you use diesel uh, filters, where water in fuel sensor is already there, so hygroscopies can be handled by water filter, as well as the density is almost uh, comparable with uh, gasoline however energy content is less hence you have to pour more fuel to achieve the same thing that's why injector design will have bigger injectors so that you can have more quantity can be poured hence if ethanol is renewable and it is available at ch cheaper price it will be definitely a fuel of preference and because it is preferred by combustion, preferred for renewable, preferred for pollution, preferred for cost. Hence, uh, it's a preferable fuel. Uh, we can say that India started with E10 and there is an announcement for E20 by 2025. And if we go on experiment it, we can take it to E85 after a lot later date, maybe E30 once everything is ready even ed95 diesel also once if you prepare a special engine for that because you require high component ratio dedicated engine for ed95 it is not easy for a diesel engine replacing with ethanol however later on we can use ethanol for producing hydrogen and hydrogen economy also can be started so this is the right time this seminar will help us to have international experience also rather than indian experience and Indian feedstocks and Indian industries are ready or gearing up for manufacturing ethanol because of the government's uh, mandate as well as government support. Uh, there are certain pros. Ethanol is having higher latent heat of vaporization. This higher latent heat of vaporization means uh, when I was first experimenting with ethanol for a small three cylinder engine for a mini track. Whenever we started the vehicle, immediately vehicle was not starting. Then we observed that ice formation in the intake manifold. Later on, we realized the latent heat of vaporization causing this 
Then there are many methods to heat it up, heated fuel, but we used only EGR, exhaust gas recirculation, which helped us warming up very fast and immediately this problem can be solved. So ethanol is also miscible with gasoline easily. However, depending on the calibration, air fuel ratio, how lambda is being maintained, we have converted a CNG engine to ethanol that is easy for us. And 60-40 uh, ratio was comfortable without any hitch, drivability was possible. But we need research beyond 60-40. However, 25 is being experimented because all current engines are capable not more than 10. Even making it to 20 itself, material compatibility to be worked. However, as an experiment, we have tried up to 60-40 without any drivability problem. How if I make a dedicated higher component ratio, then this problem can be solved. And ethanol is having a lot of problem in handling read vapor pressure, material compatibility, lower efficiency, aldehyde emissions will be there. The new norm will come for aldehyde emission and low energy content. Uh, in a spark ignition vehicle, it is slightly easier to adapt ethanol than the CI engine. However, spark ignition is yield, uh, it is very sensitive to spark plug temperature, hot spot. So we have to avoid pre-ignition. That's why the calibration, knock calibration should be proper. And uh, uh, online, if we measure the lambda and closed loop calibrations, which will help today as advanced controls had come. So it must be apt today, actually. Uh, regarding deposit formation, still we are working on additives which will reduce deposit. And the cold startability, as I told you, either EGR or we have any heater, we can use it for a cold startability problem. So there are some cons, but which can be conquered by our solutions. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, when we use ethanol for a compression ignition engine, we may require an ignition improver. And uh, because of oxygen aid, sudden peak pressure will rise. We require a closed control. Also, uh, in diesel engine also deposit formation will be there. And uh, proper fuel system is not, uh, is getting evolved right now because it is already experimented in Brazil. It is getting evolved. So what I was saying is if we have a proper injector, but more fuel flow injector. That means we have to select an injector of bigger size. Then we can integrate with any pump to make the fuel injection and combustion possibility. And uh, if at all development time, now we cannot predict because everything is new as a learning. So now we are collecting information how to enter into ethanol economy. Uh, but uh, if you take carbon monoxide or tailpipe, uh, hydrocarbon or particulate matter, everything is in decreased side. And uh, only NOx will increase, but NOx can be compared by uh, our EGR or retardation of timing. When we, in order to burn, you require advanced timing. In order to reduce NOx, you require retardation. This conflict is going on. For example, in 1908, first T4, uh, Ford, T model in 1908 was experimented on ethanol. 1916, Scania experimented on, on ethanol. And a few years back, Scania vehicles were playing in Nagpur. And uh, <clears throat> later on, many generations of experiments happened at Sweden. However, in Brazil and many countries, those experiences will be shared by our experts today. If you want to modify existing engine, there are minimum fuel system component like fuel tank, fuel filter, fuel pump, coal start aid, intake manifold, oil also to be reviewed for the design when we use methanol. However, uh, we are in Euro 6 today. So when you go to Euro 6, either SA engine combustion with three-way catalyst or dual fuel combustion plus DOC plus DPF or diesel combustion with DOT, DPF, SCR and ASC. All these things can be configured. Today we are in Euro 6. That means we are already living in pollution less world. What we are doing is in order to get energy independence, in order to have more sustainable and more growth, we are adding ethanol as one more fuel. 
I have experimented in three cylinder engine, four cylinder engine, as well as six cylinder engine. Very unfortunate, I couldn't show the picture to you. What are all the experiments we have conducted? But summary of experiment I can share with you. Uh, BSFC is poor actually because fuel consumption is high. We know that calorific value is just 40% or 50% of it. On energy conservation wise, I could calibrate, but definitely fuel is more consumed. But even though fuel is more consumed, hydrocarbon is low, carbon monoxide is low, slight increase in the NOx. And I have not modified the component ratio. I used CNG engines for this purpose. So 11.5 is to 1 component ratio. That itself is better component ratio than gasoline engine. So fuel economy is slightly better than gasoline, but not uh, as per original engines. Um, we also experimented with ultrasonic atomizer for better atomization. But in summary, when I say <coughs> our experiments are successful, even peak pressure uh, tuning, finally, maximum peak pressure we got at 20 degree advanced timing and uh, st start of combustion, we assume to be 5 degree before TDC and normal diesel combustion will take 70 degree duration and this took only 50 degree. And we have yet to experiment with uh, EGR further on the combustion and turbocharger is not modified. So if I modify a suitable turbocharger, I'll get more airflow. And uh, commercial fuel grade ethanol is underway now than my experiment now. So I can one more time put commercial fuel grade ethanol and refine the combustion. Of course, cleaner fuel uh, ethanol with oxygenate capability reducing emission and it helps uh, energy security for the country and uh, rural development and it create employment. Ethanol is uh, one of the fuel which we are welcoming now. We are understanding and we'll do the research and we will make whatever best possible either 5% or 10% or 15% to reach 20% as a roadmap. And uh, we have many information like uh, today's uh, uh, overseas expert sharing many of the papers are already published based on that our experiments are correlating this gives us confidence uh, we need to learn about the failure modes called engine burns or corrosion like that however we will uh, since it is a decarbonized carbon less fuel we will take this to up to hydrogen economy and we will make a ethanol a better world and uh, I am <coughs> reducing my talk because I would like to hear a lot of presentations again. Uh, so uh, shall I invite Mr. Kotaro Nakamuraji from Horiba, my friend, many times I met him. And Kotaro Nakamuraji had 31 years of experience in emission. So we would like to hear you, Nakamura-san. Ariyoto Jose Masu, shall I have your presentation, please? And I have assumed as moderator for this session. So I hope uh, Mrs. Susana Paz will be the next speaker. Then Dr. Richard Osborn, then Kishan Srinath, then Atelier Sayani, and Dr. Paul Coppers and Saurabh Banerjee. Thanks, uh, welcome for this great uh, economy, ethanol economy experience, please. Dr. Nakamura-san. Yes. Uh... Uh, can I uh, share my screen? Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this webinar and giving me the opportunity to talk about ethanol, ethanol economy. My name is uh, Kotaro Nakamura from Oliva, Japan. And I am going to be speaking to you today about uh, the effects of ethanol gasoline brands on tailpipe emissions from light duty vehicles. This is uh, today's agenda. First, uh, I will explain the current regulation on alcohol fuel emission measurement. And second, 
I will explain concerns regarding the characteristic of alcohol fuel emissions. Finally, uh, I uh, will explain uh, solutions to exhaust gas measurement facilities. Uh, at first, I will explain uh, about alcohol fuel emission measurement under current regulations. First of all, I would like to briefly touch on the background of the use of alcohol as a fuel for automobile, automobiles. It is my understanding that ethanol fuel first came into the spotlight in the 1970s when the price of oil skyrocketed during the first oil crisis and the use of ethanol as an alternative fuel was considered. Later in the 1980s, ethanol production using surplus food increased. And in 19, 1980s, ethanol, uh, 1990, US announced uh, the uh, revised Clean Air Act. In this revised version, which mandates the use of oxygenated fuels such as alcohol as an environmental measure in areas where atmospheric CO and ozone standards had not been achieved. We believe uh, that these developments have helped to establish the use of alcohol as an automotive fuel to some extent. About Indian regulation, E5 was notified in 2015. After that, E10 was notified in 2019. This table uh, summarizes the current regulations on alcohol and aldehyde and the method used to measure their emissions. Currently, there are regulations in the US and Brazil, but no regulations in other countries. In near future, Formaldehyde and NMOG are under consideration for additional regulation in the next European regulation, Euro 7, which will be enforced after 2025. In terms of measurement methods, each country's regulations allow the collection of exhaust gas after dilution by impingers or cartridges and chromatographic analysis. In Europe, measurement by FTIR and mass spectrum methods are also approved by WTP in addition to these methods. As explained in the previous page, the response to alcohol and aldehydes as regulatory values differs between the US and Europe. Here is an explanation of the basic concept of how AC components containing alcohol and aldehydes are regulated as mass emissions. On the left, it's a European system 
and on the right is the US. In the European system, including India, alcohol and aldehydes are supposed to be included in what is regulated as NMHC. Specifically, these components are included in what is measured as THC. However, when measuring THC using FID method, there is a relative sensitivity based on propane, which affects the measure's value as an error factor. For example, ethanol has a sensitivity of 0 0.75 when propane is set to 1.00. And then, home aldehyde has a sensitivity of zero. In the US, the regulatory value is defined as NMOG, non-methan organic gas. And these alcohol and aldehydes must be measured separately before emission calculation performed. This page shows the new regulated components for Euro 7 reported this year. In this table, hormaldehyde and NMO are also included as new regulated components. And their measurement principles include impingers and cartridges and chromatography as in US. But in addition, the FTIR method is also allowed. These are measurement devices for new species in Oliva. All devices can use home aldehyde measurement. And also, Impinger and FTIR can use alcohol measurement. Above is an image of the measurement system based on current regulations. Below is a diagram of uh, alcohol and aldehyde measurement system described in CFR part 86 subpart B. In the case of the US, alcohol and aldehyde are collected from diluted exhaust gas using an impinger and then measured using gas chromatography or liquid chromatography. Next, uh, I will explain the effects of alcohol fuel engine emissions on the measurement equipment. The following is a brief summary of how the, the emissions from vehicles using alcohol fuel differ from conventional gasoline vehicles. Low CO and low suit, and a lot of water and uh, aldehyde production, including unburned fuel emission, in emission and corrosion and swelling. Indeed, I think a lot of water and unburned fuel, including uh, exhaust gas, are uh, affected to emission facility, especially. This is an example of an actual alcohol fuel exhaust gas measured with our FTIR analyzer. The fuel is 100% ethanol and the test was uh, conducted 
in cold and hot conditions at the engine bench in steady state cycles. Ethanol is emitted in large quantities, but this is thought to be due to unburned fuel. Also, more ethanol was emitted in the cold test than in the hot test. Aldehyde are also emitted. So, though in smaller amount. These are the expected effects on the measurement equipment in the exhaust gas containing ethanol as shown in the previous page. Corrosion and absorptive uh, and contamination and more water and ABF calculation formula must change. And uh, FID sensitivity is changing and decomposition in high temperature ethanol, yeah. decomposition ethanol uh, in uh, high temperatures. Especially, I think contamination is and more water are important point for the emission measurement. For the CBS measurement method, it is necessary that no condensation occurs in the sample line. In addition, it is necessary to avoid as much as possible uh, the G influence of errors caused by absorption and spouting of alcohol components into the system. Finally, uh, I will explain solution to these concern points about the high concentration alcohol fuel emissions measurement. This is Oliver's solution to measure the emission from high concentration alcohol fuel accurately. Not necessary to necessarily proposed for any regulation. The following is an explanation of the measures taken in the emission measurement system to address the concerns mentioned before. Oliver recommends heating of emission measurement system to prevent water condensation and reduce the absorption effect in high concentration ethanol fuel emission measurement. Holm aldehyde is a byproduct of ethanol combustion, even though the concentration is low. Grove is considering to regulate it owing to its hazard to human health. Therefore, we at Holiver have developed an analyzer to measure home hard height using a new measurement technology, ARAM, infrared laser absorption modulation, which is an infrared gas analysis technology engineered to enable accurate real-time measurement even in harsh operating environment. The following is a list of items that we believe should be performed in daily inspections when testing high concentration ethanol fuel emissions. In before test, checking CBS flow rate, 
and checking condensation water in CVS sampling line physically, and checking back null test. And in after test, checking uh, CVS sampling pipe and back null test, same as before test, and about the analyzer, checking packing and rollings and drain leak in sampling unit. These are also to prevent condensate water effect and reduce absorption effect for maintaining accuracy. In conclusion, uh, to summarize this presentation. Number one, uh, regulations concerning alcohol fuel emission testing. Currently, only the US has regulation values for alcohol and aldehydes. And the measurement allows by regulation uh, including uh, those using impingers and gas chromatography. In near future, Europe is also going to establish regulations for alcohol and aldehydes. Also, uh, FTR method will be recognized. Number two, concerns about measuring alcohol fuel emissions. In Ethanol fuel engines, unburned ethanol is likely to be present in exhaust gas. And engine emissions from ethanol fuels several with raise several concerns. For example, uh, a lot of water and contamination and FID sensitivity changes and corrosion. Number three. Solution to exhaust gas measurement facilities. For measurement equipment, heating is recommended to deal with condensation and contamination. And when measuring ethanol fuel emissions, it is recommended to several checks to perform before and after the test to maintain accuracy. That's all my presentation. Thank you for attention. I'll be happy to answer any question you might be have. Thank you very much. Uh, so kindly unmute yourself. <laughs> Mr. Gassadgopan, you are muted. Very Can good. You unmute? Very good. I am unmuted now. It's okay. You are able to hear me? Yes, 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 yes clear. Now, okay. okay. Uh, Nakamura san, very good presentation. Uh, you have explained right now regulation available in Brazil and USA. Also, CFR 86 Part B explains the same. And you are introducing two more pollution for us. Uh, alcohol as well as aldehyde even though the equipment is same FTIR and chromatography but we have to worry about water condensation and ethanol unburned ethanol because unburned hydrocarbon itself FID is very sensitive we need to worry about corrosion contaminants and you have experimented you've got a solution that is a good news to us we will improve heating and CVS flow. By the way, we will solve the problem. We have to do daily checks and very nice uh, small presentation which gives us what are the precautions we should take care while measuring ethanol mixed uh, gasoline vehicles. Th thank you very much. And any questions from the audience? We can take two questions before going to next presenter. Uh, if not, I have one question, Nakamura-san. Uh, Nakamura-san, 
uh, yes. how frequently you have to service the equipment for example we are doing once in six months even though daily check is there what will be the maintenance of these equipments when we use ethanol mixed fuels I think um, when uh, high concentration uh, alcohol fuel vehicles testing, uh, maybe uh, uh, I think uh, every day uh, we recommend it to check the systems. Okay. And the filter change, any filter change every day or one month? Um, maybe I think, uh, uh, especially the analyzer's filter is uh, filter changing every day is recommended. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. There is a question. Yes, There's a question from Mr. Arun Kumar. Uh, unburned ethanol in exhaust is included in THC while checking regulation compliance or we can exclude this. Mm -hmm. uh, the question so we, is unburnt uh, ethanol. Mm -hmm. Unburnt ethanol in, uh, in exhaust, is it included in THC while checking regulation compliance? Oh. Regulation is uh, no showing no checking about uh, including uh, T, uh, THC, including uh, uh, ethanol. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nakamura-san. Uh, yes. Our next, next presenter from EDADA, a famous testing agency. Uh, Madam Susana Pass is still. She got 14 years experience on environmental and she is a chemist. She is chemical engineering expert. Welcome, Madam. The floor is yours. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon to everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, very well. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to thank to ICAT for, be, for be giving us the opportunity to present today to this webinar. Uh, now, I am going to share Can you see now my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. So I will start. Okay. One moment, please, because I am trying to remove the... Okay, now it's okay. Okay. In the following slides, I'm going to present an example of an R&D project related to ethanol. It was carried out at Aplusidiada in Spain, and the project consists of an evaluation of the impact of the use of ethanol blending it with gasoline in exhaust emissions. Here you will find the contents of the presentation. I will start with an introduction of a Plusidiada and also of powertrain department services for the people who doesn't know our company. It only will take three or four minutes, this first part. And finally, I'm going to present the project itself, detailing the concept, the experimental protocol and some of the results. A Plus Ideada is an engineering partner to the automotive industry. We are 2,500 professionals working around 22 countries and having 55 local offices. 
we are in constant innovation of our testing facilities to offer new services and technologies to our customers. And also we give complete solutions from project management to know-how in all vehicle functionalities, testing and other tools. Our headquarters is located in Spain, but you can see in this slide all our international presence. Here you can see the places where we have testing facilities with some pictures like USA, Brazil. Uh, here you can see our proving ground in Spain. We also we have facilities in Germany, Czech Republic, UK, India, China, and we have we are present in other locations like. Belgium, France, Italy, Japan, etc. The main services that we can offer are engineering, homologation, probing ground testing and testing facility design. And the vehicle functionalities that we can develop are passive safety, active safety, NBH, powertrain, comfort and reliability. Regarding the vehicle powertrain services, the services that we can offer in our powertrain department are the following uh, benchmark assessment, um, we can offer real driving emissions, we can offer engine engineering with all kinds of fuels from conventional fuels to alternative fuels, um, we can offer engine engineering with all kinds of vehicle technologies from internal uh, combustion vehicles to all typologies of electric vehicles, we can offer full fuel system development and power integration. Here in these pictures, you can see some of our facilities in Spain. Here in this picture, you can see one of our exhaust emission test cells inside a climatic chamber where we perform the exhaust emission tests in extreme conditions of temperature, uh, solar simulation. Here you have another of our exhaust emission test cells where we perform the tests at ambient temperature or at around 20-25 degrees. Here you have two of our BT sheds where we perform the evaporation emission test and here one of our engine test bench. And let us start with the study itself. Um, the aim and the concept. Uh, the aim of this study, as we said, is the evaluation of the impact of adding ethanol to gasoline in exhaust emissions. Uh, we perform this evaluation um, in terms of determination of regulated pollutants and non-regulated pollutants. As, as Mr. Cotaro said, um, some of these pollutants um, also are included, um, some of them are in, are in some countries regulated and in other countries they are not regulated. How did we achieve this goal? So we have different ethanol gasoline blends, gasoline with different percentages of ethanol. We put these fuels in the vehicles, in this case with two different vehicles. We perform the exhaust emission tests and we perform the speciation. Uh, for us, the speciation is the determination of as much as possible pollutants emitted by the vehicle. And at the end, we will have the results. Here you can see the experimental protocol, uh, the fuel matrix. Uh, we tested um, in this study with four different uh, test fuels. We tested with E0, which was the baseline of the study, and it was commercial gasoline fulfilling the EN 228 regulation. Then we had the E5 splash, which, which was a direct uh, blend of 5% uh, of ethanol in E0. And then we had E10 and E85, which had uh, 10 and 85% of ethanol in gasoline. But in this case, we choose these two fuels with similar characteristics in terms of volatility, for example, than E0. Regarding the test vehicles, we tested with, with two different typologies of vehicles. We tested with a gasoline vehicle, which was E10 compatible. And with this vehicle, we tested with E0, E5 and E10. And then we also tested with a flexifuel, flexifuel vehicle, which is E85 compatible. And with this vehicle, we tested with E0 and E85. 
and then we perform the exos emission test. That this is for the people who doesn't know, this exos emission test consists of, of, of placing the test vehicle in an emission test cell, like this one in this picture, and we simulate uh, some driving conditions similar to those that would occur on the road. The vehicle is driven on a chassis dynamometer, which is capable of simulating road load and vehicle inertia and other parameters. The driving cycle during this study was the NEDC, which has an urban part and an extra urban part, and it was performed at around 25 degrees. Regarding the test equipment, here in this table, you can see the equipment needed to analyze the regulated pollutants. At a study, in this case, in the European regulation, and you can see that for CO2, we use a non-dispersive infrared equipment, for NOx, a chemiluminescence analysis equipment, and for total hydrocarbons, we analyze with a biofeed detector. Regarding the determination of the non-regulated emissions, the equipment was the following. We have three different families of components. We have alcohols, aldates and ketones, and the individual hydrocarbons. For alcohols determination, the exos emission was sampled by an impinger sample system and went through an impinger with water, where the alcohols were retained. Then this water was analyzed to determine alcohols by gas chromatography and a feed detector. For aldehydes and ketones determination, the same impinger sample system was used, but in this case, the exos emission went through a DNPH cartridge, which is a dinitrophenylhydrazine cartridge, where the aldehydes and ketones react and were retained inside the, this cartridge. And then this cartridge was saluted with acetonitrile and the liquid obtained was analyzed by HPLC UV, which is liquid chromatography and an ultraviolet detector. And finally, for the individual hydrocarbons determination, the exos emission was sampled by a personal sampling pump to a dead larvae. And then the hydrocarbons were analyzed by a thermal desorption, gas chromatography, and a feed detector and a mass spectrometer detector. Here on the right, you can see the chromatographic techniques. The first one for the alcohols determination, this one for aldehydes and ketones determination. And this last one, uh, it was a gas chromatography for the hydrocarbons individual determination. This, this gas chromatograph is similar to the one that we use for the alcohol determination, but in this case, the system is a little bit more complex. Previously to the gas chromatograph, we, we had a thermal desorption system which um, the aim of this part, first part of the unit, was to preconcentrate the concentration of the hydrocarbons. Then we had the gas chromatograph, and then we have a dual column system. Uh, this dual column system had two columns uh, inside the gas chromatography, and this system permit to analyze the individual hydrocarbons from two atoms of carbon to 12 atoms of carbon in the same analysis. And then at the end of the chromatograph, we had two detectors, the feed detector for the quantification of the, of the hydrocarbons, and then the mass spectrometry detector for the identification. So finally, by alcohol determination, we could determine two components, methanol and ethanol, by aldehydes and ketones determination, we could determine 13 components, and by hydrocarbons determination, we could determine around 100 individual components. So in total, with, with these three different analytical methods, it was possible to identify and quantify more than 100 individual pollutants. But we have to say that in our study, around 50 of these 100 pollutants were found significant significantly. And finally, the results obtained. 
sorry. Here in this slide, you can see two bar graphs. On the left, there are the results of the gasoline vehicle with E0 and the blends of, with low percentages of ethanol. On the right, there are the results of the flexifuel vehicle and the results with the E0 and E85. In each graph, there are the results of the NEDC. First, the urban part, then the extraurban part, and then at the end, the results of the total of the cycle. The percentage that you can see here are the, um, the percentage of the emissions of each different fuel related to E0. So in this case, this percentage will be the, the reduction of the emission of, of E5 versus E0, and in this case, the reduction of E10 versus E0. And here with all the graphics that will, will come. In this case, with CO2 emissions, we can see a decrease in the total cycle with both vehicles. We can see a, de a decrease with E5, with E10 versus E0, and also we can see a decrease of E85 versus E0. In this case, with the CO2 emissions, we can see that no significant difference. Um, we, we, we don't find sig significant differences um, with low percentages of ethanol. And we can see that we see a decreased tendency with E85 of around 5%. Regarding NOx emissions, we can see an increase of E5, a decrease with E10, and an increase of E85. So in general, it's not possible to see a clear tendency to increase or decrease. Regarding total hydrocarbons emissions, we can see that with if E5, there is a decrease. E10, there is a, a low increase, but um, in these conditions, this is not significant. And with E85, we have a decrease. So in general, we can see a slight decrease tendency. And here you can see the non-regulated pollutants with the gasoline vehicle with low percentages of ethanol. Here we can see three different, the three different fa families that we spoke at the beginning of the presentation, alcohols, aldehydes and ketones, and, and the most important hi individual hydrocarbons, and the trend of each pollutant. So as a general trend and compared with E0, we can see an increase in this part, an increase of ethanol, formaldehyde, acetaldehyde, and the rest of the aldehydes and ketones remains more or less the same. And regarding the hydrocarbons from C2 to C12, we can see that some of them increase, some of them decrease, and some of them remain more or less the same. For example, we can see, uh, for example, the benzene and toluene, which are known for having damaging effects to human. Uh, we can see, for, for example, benzene and toluene that decrease. And some, of, um, some of them increase or decrease. Methylindan also decrease and etc. Similarly, here in this slide, we can see the non-regulated pollutants, but with the flexifuel vehicle with E0 and E85. Similarly, as a general trend and, and compared with E0, we can, see a uh, we can see a significant increase of ethanol, a little bit of formaldehyde and acetaldehyde. As, as we know, um, uh, they are uh, byproducts of the ethanol combustion. And on the other, on the other side, we can see the hydrocarbons. Uh, that in general, we can see that is a general decrease of all of them. So, and including the vetex uh, that, that we, we say previously that they are mm, damaging for the humans. Which vetex are benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and ethylbenzene and chilene. 
where we can see that, for example, benzene, toluene, and silens, and ethyl benzene decrease. So the general conclusions are the following. Regarding re the regulated pollutants, some increase, some of them decrease, depending on the mixture. With ethanol, formaldehyde, and acetaldehyde, there is an increase. And regarding other individual hydrocarbons, we can see that there is an increase or decrease depending on the mixture. But there is a decrease for E85 in general. And highlighting the BETEX, uh, which we can see as a general trend at a decrease. And, it, and this decrease is more important when we have E85. So we have to say that all of these results are strictly linked to the testing protocol. Um, the testing protocols such as the, the type of excess emission test, the fuel properties, and also the vehicle technology. In this last case, case of the vehicle technology, with the improving of these current technologies, such as the after treatment and engine and calibration, all these emissions will be reduced. But additionally to this, as some of you said at the beginning of the presentation, we have also to consider that ethanol is an alternative fuel. It reduces the fossil fuel dependency and taking into consideration the renewable, that ethanol is a renewable fuel. Um, in this study, we only considered the part where we come from ethanol in the tank of the vehicle to CO2 emissions through the combustion. So in this cycle of renewable fuel cycle, we go from ethanol to CO2 by through the combustion, but we did not consider that the CO2 emitted by the vehicle can be absorbed during the growing of the ethanol plant. So we did not consider this part of the cycle. So all this cycle needs to be considered to evaluate the real impact of ethanol. So it's all from our side. And many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Susanna Paz Estiville. And uh, your presentation was uh, focused on chassis dyno testing and you are able to differentiate 50 species, how the measurement can be done using common instruments, whatever we are having. However, you measured very high ethanol and other species are normal, like uh, CO2, you said that it is carbon neutral, hence uh, no issue with CO2. However, uh, there is a reducing tendency in hydrocarbon and CO, it is quite normal using E85 or E5. And when you use E85, NOx increased by 30%. So we need to do something for that. However, ethanol was showing very high. Is there ethanol is regulated anywhere at your place? If, if ethanol is regulated in my place. Ah, yes. Is it? Is it uh, so? In the, in the European regulation, not not so as long as ethanol is not regulated if it is high it's okay <laughs> you measure benzene toluene also thank you very much for, for sharing your personal experience and you gave us confidence that not only four or five pollutants we can measure you can measure up to 100 pollutants using the same equipment thank you very much any other okay. question from the floor Thank you to you. Uh, any other question from the floor? You can take it before going to next uh, presenter. I hope Saurabh, yeah. I can call next presenter. Yes. Sir, uh, there's Saurabh, a question. Just ask, uh, uh, yes, please. Yeah, from Mr. Gaurav Heda. As the experiment was done with E85, uh, so have you faced any challenge for engine calibration? That's a question. The, the E85 was tested on a flexi-fuel vehicle which was capable of be used by E85. I don't know if it answered the question. I think the question is, uh, question uh, might be that uh, uh, from a normal gasoline engine, if the vehicle has been done any special tuning or special calibration for uh, E85. 
Even. No, the, the special calibration that have the flexi fuel vehicle to to be used with this fuel. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I there You're is a welcome. slight change instead of doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sana. Actually, his question was any calibration challenges since you have concentrated on measurement after it is calibration, so you might not have faced any problem. That is why it is answered. So before uh, I would like to welcome, there is a slight change. I would like to welcome Saurabh Banerjee, general manager from IOCL who has 31 years of experience before the next uh, presenter. Uh, Banerjee, sir, the floor is yours. Please uh, enlighten us on ethanol, your vast experience of 35 years. Uh, good day, good afternoon to everybody. Am I audible? So yes, yes, sir. Yes, Good afternoon. I'll start my screen sharing. First of all, I'll say that uh, I am very privileged to be part of this group and in this forum, and I'm able to present to you my experience. Uh, I'm Saurabh Banerjee. I'm representing Indian Oil Corporation Limited. And uh, today I'll be I'll be presenting to you on the in, particularly in Indian scenario the ethanol availability, the logistics and distribution challenges. So a little bit to touch on the national biofuel policy 2018, the highlights which is of, uh, from the government of India. That uh, it, this policy en uh, enables us that availability of biofuels should be enough in the market so that uh, I mean we can reach the desired target. And an indicative target which is set by the government of India is 20% of blending of ethanol uh, in petrol by 2025. And uh, also biodiesel is also coming up. Uh, it, it's by 5% by 2030. And uh, the main, uh, the, the goal is to be achieved by like, uh, we have to ensure availability of ethanol. So we have to increase the production, setting up 2G biorefineries, development of new feedstock for biofuels, development of new technology for convergence to biofuel and creating a suitable environment in the country so that biofuel, it can be integrated with the main fuels like MSN, HST. Now, if we see the, I mean, if, for in, in Indian context, if we see the roadmap for, for uh, India ethanol blended petrol, currently as of, I mean, as late as 16th August, uh, our all India percentage is 8.06. As of now, the mandate is E10. And we plan that 100% pan India E10 will be achieved by 1st of April 2022. And we have given a midterm target also that uh, in October, by October and November 21, within this year, wherever whichever states are surplus in ethanol there we will try to go for e12 and the next target is by 1st of april 2023 that we will start e20 and the plan of the government of india is that we must achieve e20 pan india by 2025 and my entire presentation will be focused on how we can uh, achieve this and with the main thrust from our national perspective is to reduce the import and uh, like to use the indigenously produced uh, ethanol. Now the present consumption of petrol in India is approximately 4,000 crore. Crore is the unit which we use in India. One crore is equivalent to 10 million. And pre present uh, blending is 10%. So with that calculation, we can see what we required is ethanol is 400 crore liter for uh, per, 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 per annum. And uh, the availability as of now is only 350 crore liters. Still, there is a 50 crore deficit. By 2024, the target is we need 750 crore liter of uh, uh, ethanol. And by 2025, we need 1100 crore liter. This is assuming that 7% year on year growth on petrol uh, based on whatever is the consumption in Indian market. This is the latest sheet on which I mean, and, and the sheet which I'm presenting is combined Indian Oil Corporation, BPC and HPC, all our uh, public sector oil companies uh, taken together. The cumulative percentages in the last column, you can see it is 8.06 and the present availability. And in this uh, year, we count it in terms of ethanol sugar year, like December 20 to November 21 is the ethanol sugar year. So I will be explaining a little about the ethanol sugar year in what period it is available. So at present we are at 8.06 and our target is that by November we must reach uh, all India 8.5% uh, 
and uh, particularly we can see few of the states where we are low in performance like jammu and kashmir has recently started then no some north in uh, north eastern states uh, we are low we are trying to increase it otherwise by and large if you see an average most of the state it is higher than 9% now mainly the uh, feed stock which is uh, used for ethanol in, in in india basis sugar cane juice and sugar and then then we have also the second derivative that is b heavy molasses c heavy molasses and now government has also permitted damaged food grain surplus rice as we know that uh, i mean we have got a we have surplus in rice and uh, many uh, agricultural products so that surplus rice can be utilized for ethanol and Uh, basically, I have I have also shared the data of BPC HPC that what are the quantities we have received over the year, and the mainly the uh, the crushing season is take takes place between uh, uh, October till May, and that is the period when ethanol is available and balance period the whatever ethanol is uh, produced that is distributed across the year. So this that is how there is it's a concept of ethanol uh, supply year. and if we go to a little bit into the history i have given the percentages from as uh, 2012 13 so when uh, that time india was at uh, just 0.67% from there we have come to a level of 8.06% today now this is the our projection that in 2025 how do we reach to that uh, target the e20 now 5000 now on the right hand side of my screen it's the niti ayog figures and on the left hand side it is the ppsc figures so on the bottom we can see the last uh, row you can see that total ms sales projected in 2025 to 26 is about 5100 uh, crore liters so considering 20% of that it is 1000 uh, crore liters and uh, that uh, we as of now the availability is roughly 350 so the deficit is 650 now what are we doing to address that deficit is we are making some new plants ioc bpc hpc which i will explain in the subsequent slides we are making some new plants from where we will be generating this 184 crore liter of uh, uh, ethanol plus then we will be remaining with a deficit of 468 crore liters so this will be what we will do is we are encouraging ethanol uh, in a big way and we are encouraging the i mean investment in this people who have got land who have got water and who can make or develop ethanol plants they must come and whatever feed stock they can use they must produce ethanol in india that's the thrust of the government this is the action plan that we invite the expression of interest from proposed ethanol manufacturers and msmes for setting up ethanol plant with uh, the capacities are given 100 uh, kl per day to 500 kl per day the minimum criteria which government has prescribed is there should be availability of the own land availability of water water is the essential requirement for ethanol plant and consent to establish that is our pollution control norms every state government has got a pollution control board so there should be a consent then about the agreements and all this i will be uh, i mean be covering in the subsequent slides now the potential food stocks which are available in india as of now maximum available available is the sugar cane juice sugar syrup and sugar this is one category the highest category followed by b heavy molasses c heavy molasses then damaged food grain unfit for human consumption maize has also now been included and also surplus light uh, rice from food corporation of india and also from open market now the production challenges if we see that presently in india if we see the geography of india ethanol is presently surplus in four states that is uttar pradesh maharashtra punjab and karnataka the surplus uh, quantity which is uh, available after meeting the sub uh, state school quantity that can be given to other states so all other states are receiving surplus from these states and this has uh, generated the necessity of having 1g and 2g bio refineries in state which are not self sufficient we are iucl is in the process of acquiring land and constructing four 1g bio refineries of 500 kl per day which is equivalent to uh, 15 crore liters per annum each in odisha chatisgarh andhra pradesh and telangana and iuc is also putting up a 2g bio refinery plant at panipat which at 3 crore liters per annum 2g bio refinery it, it uses cellulo lignose uh, i mean i mean the, that is agricultural res residue from that also we can make the ethanol so that that's how we are trying to increase the ethanol production similarly our counterparts bharat petroleum and hindustan petroleum they are also putting up major bio refineries in the deficit states these are the production production now we come to the logistic part 
Presently, the, the ethanol is being transported across the length and breadth of the country by, by the trucks. And when it is moved by the trucks, in India, we have the following issues, the interstate permit issues. Then in few states, there are additional import fees like in Rajasthan and West Bengal. Then whenever you cross the state border, there are some I mean, hurdles by Octroy and all those things. Then requirements of the TT crew, especially in view of our COVID-19 pandemic. Then cost of road transportation is very high. And also there is need to be an availability of proper trucks, which is meeting class A peso requirement. Peso is our petroleum regulatory body. So a solution has been found out that if we don't want to transport by road to that extent, whether we can, can we use rail? So one of the logistic solution is that we can use the existing railway availability, the BTP and wagons. So in this direction also, our oil industry has been successful. We have already done pilot rollout for IOCL from Mathura refinery to Jammu depot, where an entire full rakes of uh, E10, that is 10% uh, ethanol blended MS, has been uh, transported. Similarly, HPCL has rolled out from Kanpur to Madhya Pradesh and West Bengal. So the only precautions, I mean, uh, say, which we have to take while transportation by wagon is that there is a, there should not be any water ingress because ethanol and water don't go together if there are quality issues. So that is prevented by using waterproof uh, neoprene rubber gaskets and neoprene ca caps at all the joints which are available in the wagon fitting. So I have given a photo also so that we can have a look, I mean, how it is being done. And this is a facility. We have got a very large infrastructure amongst the OMCs in all over India. So in all tank wagon loading and unloading locations, we can have this kind of facility. And this is a prom promising mode of transportation in long run. But if we see the optimum solution, the best solution which will be is the ISO container. The, even we can transport pure ethanol, that is E100, which can be do through ISO containers, which can be mounted on flatbed railway wrecks through Concor. And uh, I mean, it can be directly moved across the length and breadth of the country. So the procedure in this will be like this, that we will directly fill the ISO container mounted on a flatbed trailer at an ethanol manufacturing plant and then move to the nearest railhead. Then they will be mounted on the flatbed railway rakes and then move wherever it is required. And again, unloading on a flatbed trailer and transporting to the nearest uh, OMC location. And this is a solution which is a uh, safe, which is issueless, and it is also logistically economical. A few, these are the photos. How, I mean, this is how it is uh, modeled. I mean, recently, I mean, during the COVID pandemic crisis also, even oxygen uh, movement had been taken place in the ISO containers. So this is a similar kind of arrangement which we are thinking of. Now, government has given a lot of thrust to increase the ethanol production. So the business enablers are that we have made a new five-year procurement policy that now we will be entering into agreements with whosoever are putting up their plants or they are producing. We have simply, as being in a public sector, we have to go through a tendering process, a public trend, which should be very transparent. Then we have given realization, this penalty reduction. Earlier, we had a penalty of 5%, security deposit of 5%. We have reduced that. Then period of supply, we have, I mean, put it as the ethanol sugar year. Then we are registering the vendors and at each month we are giving an opportunity to the vendor to offer us ethanol. This way we are promoting ethanol in a big way. Then also the further we are also doing is that government is encouraging that uh, we form do a kind of tripartite agreement between the vendor, the oil marketing company and the bank in which the bank will offer the soft loan to the vendor to set up his plan. And we will have a sort of escrow account mechanism by which the OMC, that is Indian Oil, BPC and HPC, whatever ethanol we are purchasing from the vendor, we will directly pay to the escrow account, which will be utilized towards paying the EMI of the uh, infrastructure, which uh, vendor, the loan which vendor has been taken. And similarly, we will be giving the comfort letter and agreements with the OMC or to the vendor so that and also uh, the single window concept that faster payment we should be made paid within uh, 21 days and we, we are trying to give an environment to the vendors that it, uh, I mean there is ease to do the business and uh, we want people to come forward and invest in uh, the um, uh, ethanol production. Now if we see the overall Indian scenario this is the 
like the i mean we find most of the states have done more than 9% so only little bit where we are on lagging behind is tamil nadu odisha jharkhand west bengal and jammu and kashmir but there also we have started and northeast also shortly i mean recently we have started so with this coverage i think we should be able to um, i mean complete pan india so we we divide the all the indian states into three categories uh, the green color is high blending that is more than 9% Uh, yellow is the uh, medium blending between 6 to 9 and low blending is less than 6 now if we see the previous year the, i mean the current ethanol sugar year we are finding that there is a continuous growth i mean at the beginning of the in december 20 we were only 6.12% which we have almost reached to 9.20% uh, over the year despite uh, there is a covid uh, pandemic period i mean the second wave between march april may there was there the graph is was straight but after that again it has picked up and now again msls have have picked up and this uh, this area we are getting the full growth only thing our concern is we are not getting the full ethanol quantity which is required with for our consumption now what are the steps taken by the government to give philip to the ebp program we have introduced uh, you know normally ms and hsd they are not they are decontrolled but for ethanol we have introduced administered pricing mechanism since december 2014 we have al open alternate route for ethanol production second generation including petrochemicals the government has i mean made amendment to the various act so that the roles of central and state governments have been clarified that no i mean free movement uninterrupted movement of ethanol can take place between the states we have notified the national bio policy, uh, policy on biofuels and uh, the department of food and public distribution they have approved 607 proposals uh, giving a loan of about 35000 uh, crore cumulative under the interest subvention scheme and these are all towards development of ethanol plant so that we have we have more of ethanol in india to add to that the notified extension is to the whole of india except uh, to the union territories of andaman nicobar and lakshadweep island which is uh, which are on the sea but i am sure in years to come even those areas we will be uh, covering under e10 then new sources of sugar and uh, sugar syrup have been introduced uh, ethanol procurement priority based on raw material utilized we have liberalized i mean any kind of law metra raw material can be used except that we don't permit imports and registration of ethanol suppliers for a period of 5 years so that in next 15 years we can go very matlab at least up to e20 very easily and if government uh, further revises the program we can go further ahead in the in terms of ethanol and the ultimate goal is the same we want to reduce the import bill uh, we want to i mean we want to save on the crude oil and use the natural resources which are available in india then again ease of tender condition by omcs like one time document this is they are all part of one time uh, i mean the single window concept one time document submission quarterly bank guarantees multiple transportation lays so, i mean we are i mean we are regularly having meeting with the vendors and the i mean whatever issues they are having one by one those issues we are being we are solving them every week i mean twice a week there is a meet in the presence of the uh, secretary of uh, the petroleum and natural gas and secretary of uh, food and um, uh, public distribution similarly there is a national biofuel coordination committee the with they, that they call, they i mean coordinate with the fci for release of surplus rice then uh, we are also utilizing the mace and uh, the differential ethanol pricing is being paid at, by omcs as the raw material for the raw material interest subvention scheme this is again a kind of a soft loan which union cabinet has approved so that you know i mean various vendors can uh, put up their plants and increase ultimate goal is and i mean even from like barley maize corn and rice we can manufacture get the ethanol manufactured and make it available so that ultimate goal of e20 is may uh, uh, can be met in india this is also an additional thing comfort letter and agreement which we are, we are giving to the vendor so that they can submit to all government authorities to bank so that uh, i mean they get the i mean they get the agreements they get the soft loans uh, they get all kind of encouragement tripartite agreement is again i i have already covered earlier this is an agreement between the ethanol supplier the financier that is the state bank of india or any nationalized bank and the oil marketing company as per this agreement 
the steward the payment towards the supply of ethanol is made to an escrow account to the lending bank and lending bank will deduct monthly installment and release the balance amount to the supply so these are all the thrust which government is giving to increase the ethanol production and hopefully the way the thrust and even our honorable prime minister is giving the thrust we are sure that uh, i mean from omc side we are quite sure that we will be meeting the requirement of e20 in india by 2025 with that i complete my presentation thank you so much thank you thank you very much uh, saurabh sir uh, can i ask you one thing what are the safety precautions to be handle ethanol uh, sir safety precautions if i may say so so there are two things is ethanol is equivalent to a class a product so whatever precautions we have to take for uh, petrol the same thing we have to do that uh, i mean we need to have that uh, the foam system in our locations we have that uh, uh, that sprinkler system foam system and second important thing no water should get increased so the uh, trucks should have the proper fittings or even if wagons are used they should have the neoprene seal water should never get mixed with ethanol and uh, pure ethanol as they say there is a safety hazard pure ethanol uh, i mean it is invisible the fire, in case there is a fire of uh, pure ethanol it will be invisible so it, there is always is that we can go up to e85 but some quantity of ms must be there so that the flame is visible so these are the main thing otherwise the normal whatever precautions we take for a class a product like uh, motor spirit or petroleum or gasoline the same pro precautions are to be taken for ethanol <laughs> and why iso container sir because other fuels are having also having iso container uh, sir iso container uh, the i mean the idea has come from during the discussion with the various associations and the vendors themselves because they are finding difficulty in getting so many trucks and moving across now you imagine uh, there is a in maharashtra the sugar cane i mean ethanol is available in maharashtra and he has to go to arunachal pradesh to take the truck to such a long distance it is uneconomical he will demand a very high rate which is again not economical so i mean if we can have a this kind of a system that uh, i mean if it can be directly loaded in our btp and then btp and wagons then it can be going through the rail system but if we have the iso container then you know the total geography is free that we take wherever the plant is there from the plant we can pick up the ethanol and uh, we can put to on rail head then rail will carry it to anywhere which is required and again do so i mean when we discuss this across to the various associations and the ethanol manufacturers all have agreed that this is the most uh, optimum solution and even ministry of railways right. is going ahead with it their department depart the concur they are also i mean doing active research on this they also want to promote this okay thank you and uh, you could able to feel energy savings right now after 8% across throughout india you showed green sir, sir, so mean, you are I able mean, to feel india's gdp i mean import bills are coming down whatever extent we can do ethanol to that extent our import bill will come down price of it i mean this is something which government has to decide but certainly being a member i can say that price of uh, petrol whatever is there we all know what is the price of petrol in the market if we add ethanol to it the price of petrol is does not get reduced so to that extent it is adding to the i mean to the uh, i mean government's coffers it's adding to our national economy and we are saving thank you the thank you very much thank you very much for your wonderful insight and given confidence that we can go ahead on engine design so that ethanol is available now okay yes, thanks sir. thank you very much and the quality of ethanol also you explained very well thank you very much any other thank question you. is not that we'll go to yes. next sir sure, 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 sure. is there any question there if not we can go to next speaker i will invite uh, ritu nimura san from honda who got 23 years experience and honda is a innovative company nimurasan so sotai sa sate kudasi yokoso arigato hosai masu and i would like to hear innovation from you for the audience thank you very much thank you saurabh sir thank you nimurasan thank you can you hear me can you hear me yes yes you are audible
Could you show the presentation? Yes, presentation is visible. Thank you. Thank you for introduction. I am Nimla from Honda Motor, Motorcycle Island D. Today, I will explain about FFM, Flex Fuel Motorcycles, developed by Honda for Brazil. Focusing on the related technology and the effect on the environment. Firstly, I will explain about widespread use of ethanol in Brazil. This figure indicates requirement of each country about ethanol blending concentration. Dark blue colored Brazil shows that even normally gasoline has high ethanol blending. On the other hand, 100% ethanol is also widely sold. Widespread use of ethanol in Brazil is increasing most rapidly compared to other countries in the world. There was customer demand for selection between ethanol branded gasoline or 100% ethanol based on fuel price. So the ethanol mixing ratio in the fuel tank changed from 22% to 100% case by case basis. Then Honda developed FFM flex fuel motorcycles for Brazil. In today's presentation, flex fuel system and flex fuel vehicle or motorcycle means the system or vehicle capable of running on any ratio of ethanol blended gasoline. This slide explains the trend of ethanol consumption in Brazil. The graph on the top left side indicate major event related on ethanol and each year based production. Horizontal axis of graph is year and the vertical axis is ethanol production volume. After 1980s, ethanol production was significantly increased. The graph on the left lower side indicates ethanol blend ratio in Brazil on year basis. Horizontal axis of the graph is year and the vertical axis is the required ethanol blending ratio in the country. After 2015, normal gasoline has included 27.5% ethanol. The graph on the top right side indicates the trend of transport fuel consumption of Brazil on a yearly basis. Horizontal axis of the graph is year and the vertical axis is consumption volume of each fuel in the country. Alcohol, ethanol, account for half of gasoline consumption in 2005. Ethanol consumption keeps on increasing year by year. This slide explains expansion of automobiles compatible with ethanol in Brazil. The graph shows sales volume of automobiles compatible with ethanol based on yearly basis. Horizontal axis of the graph is year and the, on the vertical axis is sales volume. Pink color bars are gasoline vehicle sales volume. Gray colored bar are dedicated ethanol vehicle sales volume. Yellow colored bars are flex fuel vehicle sales volume. Gray data shows transition of commercial fuel in Brazil. In 1980s, dedicated ethanol vehicles were tentatively expanded. However, from viewpoint of convenience to select fuel freely, 2003 onwards, FFB expanded dominantly. 
Subsequently, most of automobiles sold in Brazil are now flex fuel vehicles. So that customers can input fuel of their choice. This slide explains expansion of two wheelers compatible with ethanol in Brazil. The graph shows production volume of two wheelers compatible with ethanol and the percentage of FFM on yearly basis. Horizontal axis, the graph is year and the vertical axis is production volume and the percentage of each fuel type. For two wheelers, flex fuel motorcycles are about 60% of the total production in Brazil. This slide explains about types of FFM models in Brazil. The graph shows FFM models line up on yearly basis. Since Honda CG150 sales started in 2009, many models of FFM ranging from 155 to 300 cc have been introduced and sold by OEMs in Brazil. As the customers have many options under FFM category to select the models, FFM total sales volume increased in Brazil. Second agenda is impact of ethanol on CO2 emission. This slide explained impact of ethanol fuel on CO2 emission. Left side graph shows carbon intensity volume of current certified pathways. Vertical axis is type of energy and the horizontal axis is amount of CO2 emission when producing energy of one megajoule. CO2 emission will vary depending upon how ethanol is produced in each country. In Brazil, CO2 emission of second generation ethanol, high efficiency produced from sugarcane, is less than that of electricity generation. Light side graph shows ethanol production efficiency for each type of ingredient and related production cost. Energy production efficiency from sugarcane is quite high. Consequently, production cost in Brazil is lower than other countries or regions. To summarize, CO2 emission per unit of energy drilling ethanol production in Brazil is lower than CO2 emission per unit of energy drilling electricity generation. This slide explains comparison of CO2 emission between ethanol fueled vehicles and EVs. Left side graph shows CO2 emission of electric automobiles. Horizontal axis is country name and the vertical axis is CO2 emission of EV, EV calculated from electricity generation portfolio of each country. Depending upon electricity generation portfolio, EV running CO2 emission will vary. Light side graph shows two wheelers CO2 emission well to wheel based for different fuel types. CO2 emission from ethanol two wheelers is almost the same as level as EV two wheelers in Brazil. Expansion of ethanol fuel has potential to provide reduction in CO2 emissions. Third agenda is ethanol compatibility technology and related issues. Firstly, this slide explained ethanol fuel impact on fuel economy. This slide graph shows the relationship between ethanol blending concentration and the fuel economy. 
horizontal axis is ethanol concentration and the vertical axis is fuel economy. As indicated in left upper table, because cal cal calorific value of ethanol is lower than that of gasoline. Hence, in order to get same horsepower, more ethanol volume is required as compared to gasoline. Compared to E20 gasoline, E100 will be consumed by about 30% more in terms of volume. Right side graph shows the change of both fuel price, gasoline and ethanol, in the middle of 2010s. Vertical axis is fuel price and horizontal axis is month. Red color line is gasoline price. Blue color line is ethanol price. Green color line is ethanol price increased by 30%. Brazil customers understand the difference so that they select fuel type by comparing each fuel's price and each fuel economy. For example, ethanol refueling will have cost merit in lead circled months. Hence, FFN has potential to provide cost merit to the customers. This slide explains ethanol impact on exhaust emission. Left side graph shows relationship between ethanol concentration and serological air by fuel ratio for ideal combustion. Vertical axis is serological air by fuel ratio and the horizontal axis is ethanol concentration. Depending upon the concentration of ethanol, Required air volume for ideal combustion will vary. For same air volume, injected fuel will also vary in order to achieve ideal combustion. Right side graph shows three kinds of exhaust emission, CO, HC, and NOx, on different, bl different blend of ethanol concentration. Controlling fuel injection volume electrically provides appropriate fuel volume adjustment so that impact to exhaust emission will be little. Additionally speaking, sensing of fuel volume adjustment factor can provide estimation of ethanol concentration to be injected. This slide explains ethanol refueling impact on engine startability. Left side upper table shows flash point of each fuel. E100 flash point is 12 degree Celsius higher than that of gasoline. Left side graph shows the relationship between engine oil temperature and the time duration for starting of engine. Horizontal axis is engine oil temperature and vertical axis is engine cracking time. After long parking time, engine oil temperature is same as ambient air temperature. Red line is 100% ethanol. If engine oil temperature, which means air temperature, is below 10 Celsius degree, engine cranking time increases. When air temperature is close to zero degrees Celsius, it will be difficult to start engine. This causes customer inconvenience. Some automobiles in Brazil have sub gasoline tank to improve engine startability under low air temperature. The system indicate at light figures out the need of two fuel routes, one for gasoline and the other one for ethanol. This slide explains ethanol refueling impact on engine startability for two wheelers. 
right side upper graph shows the relationship between engine oil temperature and time duration for starting of engine, same as previous slide. Please pay attention to blue circled area. When ethanol blended concentration is below 90%, engine can start under minus 10 Celsius degree. In other words, even through, if customer refuses 100% ethanol, addition of small amount of gasoline provide engine starting under low temperature. In the beginning of FFM cells, alcohol indicators are installed in order to suggest that customers should refuel the vehicles with gasoline. The FFM system memorizes the estimated ethanol concentration during previous driving cycle and further by considering the temperature information from oil temperature sensor. The system can inform the necessity of refueling the vehicle with gasoline. Additionally, SSM technology includes the enhancing of corrosion resistance of components exposed to fuel. Finally, this slide explains the ethanol impact on combustion. Upper table shows the characteristic of gasoline and ethanol. There are octal number differences between gasoline and ethanol. Octal number of ethanol is higher than that of gasoline. In other words, knocking is not likely to occur in dedicated ethanol vehicle. Knocking results in significant engine damage due to abnormal combustion. Gasoline vehicle has the setting of ignition timing so that knocking will not occur. Dedicated ethanol vehicle can increase engine output by advancing the ignition timing, considering rare occurrence of knocking. On the other hand, for FFM, ethanol blending concentration in the tank varies. Hence, ignition timing is set in a way that the knocking should not occur under the condition that the tank is refueled with gasoline, which causes knocking. Finally, it is conclusion. The conclusion of today's presentation as uh, uh, as follows. First, expansion of ethanol fuel has potential to provide a reduction in CO2 emission. Second, in case that large amount of fossil fuel is used for electricity generation, CO2 emission of vehicles compatible to ethanol is lower than that of an EVs. Third, customers may have merit with refueling of ethanol depending upon price. Fourth, items required for the development of vehicles compatible with ethanol blended fuels are to, to adjust fuel injection volume and to enhance corrosion resistance of components exposed to fuel. In items uh, fifth, items required to for the development of vehicles compatible with high concentrate ethanol gas fuel mixtures such as E100, engine startability under low temperature. FFM has various issues to be resolved so that FFM can run on all ratios of ethanol blending. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Nimura san. Uh, I think if there are questions, I will ask you. However, uh, you have explained about motorcycles in Brazil. 
150 cc to 300 cc and where co2 reduction is effective with the help of uh, ethanol and every time lambda equal to one just depending on our flow and uh, fuel if ethanol is more it is to be gauged i hope fuel sensor being used there. Mr. Sadgopan, I guess your voice is not clear. Mr. Sadgopan. You know, can you switch off his video? Switch off his video, then his voice will be clearer. Okay. Uh, can you? We need to. Concentrate. Coffee on the show is so I can't hear you. Also. Unfortunately, I think there is some uh, audio issue, so we are not able to hear uh, Mr. Sadagopan clearly. So uh, on behalf of uh, uh, some questions that have come up, uh, I think to Mr. Nimura San, uh, why Brazil has chosen uh, 26 to 27 percent of ethanol as lower range for EFM, EFFM or default gasoline vehicles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll repeat the question again. Uh, why Brazil has chosen uh, 26 to 27 percent of ethanol as lower range uh, for FFM uh, or for default gasoline vehicles? So, really, Kui, no, no. Brazil has a long ethanol uh, history and uh, uh, fuel uh, ethanol concentration, concentration is very, and so uh, 18 percent to 27.5 percent. And so FFM uh, adapt to uh, under 20 percent. Uh, concentration ratio of ethanol. I can't hear you. Yeah, uh, Inok, we will uh, Inok, your move voice towards... was not audible. Inok, your voice okay. was not audible. Can you repeat? Yeah, I think there was some audio issue with Mr. Sadgopan. We will move towards the next speaker, uh, Mr. Richard Osborne. Uh, Dr. Richard Osborne, he graduated from Oxford University and uh, with a master's degree in engineering science in 1999. Uh, he joined the gasoline engines department at Ricardo in the same year and has been working on the development of gasoline engines and their combustion systems since then. He gained his PhD uh, from University of Brighton in 2010 with a, th with, with a thesis entitled Controlled Auto Ignition Processes in the Gasoline Engine. He now holds the position of a global technical expert, sustainable engines at Ricardo. 
and has an experience in engine downsizing and boosting lean burn combustion systems, variable valve trains, homogeneous charge compression ignition, and sustainable liquid fuels. Uh, Dr. Richard has published over 30 technical and journal papers on IC engines and has won several awards. And uh, we are honored with your presence today, sir. Uh, and over to you, sir, for your presentation. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Hopefully you can you can hear me okay. Yeah, you can, you can hear you. Okay, great. And uh, let me just present. Uh, so can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so thank you very much uh, to ICAT uh, for the invitation to um, present um, today. Uh, I'm going to talk slightly more generally around the topic of uh, engines and sustainable um, fuels. Um, so we've also already had a, a detailed introduction uh, to me, so I can uh, skip over skip over this. Just a very brief uh, introduction. Uh, to Dr. Richard, your slide uh, is uh, very small in size. Can you enhance uh, the size, make a slideshow? Yeah, that's better. That? Yeah, okay, that's better. Yeah. So Ricardo is a global uh, en environmental and engineering consultancy um, founded uh, by Sir Harry Ricardo over uh, 100 years ago um, and headquarters are on the south coast uh, of the UK uh, at Shoreham. Um, so we're employing just under 3000 um, people across uh, 51 sites in 20 countries and of course that's uh, including uh, India. So we've been focused on the automotive sector for, for many, many years, um, but we've uh, expanded in recent years to cover um, different sectors, uh, including um, aerospace. And uh, Ricardo has the uh, domain knowledge uh, in developing ethanol fueled um, products. Uh, so we cover the, uh, the spectrum from strategy um, through to production. So covering design and analysis, mechanical development, uh, performance development, uh, control and calibration uh, and product testing through to um, production um, support. So uh, in my presentation today, I'm going to talk about engines and electrification by way of introduction, and that, that is including ethanol fueled uh, engines, then talk about the role of um, sustainable fuels. Um, I'll touch on the fuel properties and hardware impacts for ethanol blends, and then I'll talk about um, ethanol um, to gasoline um, fuels. So the, the automotive industry is experiencing a period of unprecedented um, change. Uh, the primary challenge is the, the urgent need to defossilize um, transport in order to um, uh, meet the climate uh, challenge and, and uh, meet the Paris uh, Agreement. Um, at the same time, uh, the industry must continue to reduce air quality emissions um, provide uh, a larger range of vehicle uh, architectures and, and bring vehicles to the market um, more quickly. But alongside all of these challenges, um, the electrification of vehicles is also a major opportunity for um, the internal um, combustion engine. And I'll, I'll explain what I, what I mean by that. So, we can consider a range of uh, vehicles from uh, purely internal combustion engine vehicles at one end of the spectrum to uh, battery electric vehicles or, or fuel cell electric vehicles at the other end. And in between, we have the micro and mild hybrids and then the full hybrids um, in their various forms uh, and a series uh, hybrid or range extended um, electric vehicles. So for the, the conventional engines, the, 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 um, uh, the 
engine has to follow a wide uh, range of, of um, speed and load. So we have to try and improve the efficiency of all of this uh, wide operating range. But if we think about uh, the other end of the spectrum, uh, a series hybrid, uh, we can operate at a, over a very narrow uh, range of engine speed and load. So potentially you know, as few as two operating points, uh, a rated power point and um, a peak uh, efficiency point. And that narrow operating range gives us the opportunity to, to uh, significantly uh, develop the engine and to take advantage of this, um, uh, this uh, reduced um, range of conditions. And we, we call this type of engine a dedicated uh, hybrid uh, engine. And um, Carlo has been working on um, a research project developing a dedicated hybrid engine. Uh, in this case, it's a three cylinder, uh, 1.5 litre uh, turbocharged direct uh, injection gasoline engine. And um, we can take advantage of this uh, dedicated hybrid operation to simplify uh, areas such as the valve train, um, the boosting system, uh, and apply some uh, novel features like the um, a lightweight block structure and covers for uh, encapsulation for the thermal efficiency and, and MVH um, benefits. So turning now to the role of uh, sustainable fuels. Um, so we, uh, Ricardo, we believe that the um, the climate solution for road transport requires both battery electric vehicles and um, sustainable fuels and that both of these are, are required urgently. So sustainable fuels uh, can address the existing uh, internal combustion engine fleet. So this is 1.4 billion uh, vehicles worldwide and, and rising. Uh, and also the, the hard to electrify um, applications. So the, the, um, the whole picture for sustainable fuels is a, a complex one. Um, this diagram shows uh, the range of options from, from biofuels, including ethanol, which is our, our topic uh, today, um, through hydrogen and uh, ammonia to to electrofuels or e-fuels, so um, uh, fully synthetic um, fuels. Uh, as an industry, I think it's important that we, you know, we don't expend uh, time and energy on uh, debating what is the perfect uh, sustainable fuel. Um, it's likely that we'll need all of these options uh, in uh, different markets and uh, different applications. We also need uh, life cycle or well to wheels based uh, CO2 regulations um, or you know, at least um, a fuels crediting um, system of the, of the type that um, is being discussed in Europe. Um, of course, only the complete life cycle uh, matters to, to the environment, not just uh, um, uh, the tailpipe. So I'll turn now to uh, fuel properties and, and hardware impact for, for ethanol um, blends. Of course, there is um, a great uh, interest in ethanol in uh, the Indian market as this um, audience will um, will know very well uh, with the E20 um, target for 2025 um, in the in the ethanol roadmap. If we look uh, worldwide, we have um, E5 and E10 as uh, mainstream uh, gasoline fuels in um, different markets. We have E15, E15 in some um, um, states um, in the in the US, um, and we have obviously the E20 target um, for for India, and then we have the higher 
uh, blend concentrations in use in flex fuel vehicles in uh, in the US and in Europe and elsewhere, uh, and obviously E100 uh, in uh, Brazil, as we've we've heard about already today, and uh, and as a potential future uh, target for for India. Um, we are blending uh, ethanol from biosources for a variety of reasons, so energy security, uh, CO2 uh, benefits, and uh, some air quality um, benefits. Um, but blending ethanol fundamentally affects the fuel properties and requires uh, changes to the base engine and the, the uh, vehicle uh, fuel and after treatment system. So although ethanol is a very uh, familiar fuel uh, in many ways, it is, it is not a drop-in fuel. It requires um, um, changes. So what are the uh, properties of, of um, ethanol fuel? So uh, this is you know, something we've heard quite a lot about already uh, today and yesterday. Uh, we have increase in um, octane number, uh, we have decreases in uh, fuel calorific um, value, uh, we have decreases in, in uh, vapor pressure for high um, ethanol blends, um, and we have increases in um, the uh, heat of vaporization. And we need to pay careful attention to the materials compatibility um, issues, so corrosivity. Um, compatibility with plastics and elastomers, um, lubricity and, and electrical um, conductivity. What, what attributes does that give us? Um, so here we have um, uh, reference in, in uh, yellow color and then potential benefits in, in light and darker green and uh, potential disadvantages in um, orange and, and red color um, and yeah i think you know as we've we've heard a lot already today and some of the other presenters have, have covered this in detail we can see some uh, performance increases uh, we have uh, the issue with um, increases in volumetric fuel consumption uh, which is something that uh, is a I guess a, a customer uh, education uh, issue primarily. Um, we have relatively small changes in tank to wheel CO2, um, but reductions in life cycle um, CO2, um, which is which is very important. And then we have some selective um, emissions benefits, but also some uh, selected emissions uh, challenges. Um, particularly around aldehydes, and, and we've heard a lot about that from some of the, the earlier um, presenters. So uh, fi finally then, what are the hardware impacts of uh, ethanol fuel blends? Um, so in this uh, diagram, again, the yellow uh, color is the, is the sort of carryover reference, so no, no change required. Uh, green indicates the, the potential to um, undertake modifications to give a, a, a benefit, so to improve um, an, an attribute. Uh, and red indicates um, that um, you know, changes are, are necessary. So you know, for E20, uh, the degree of changes that are needed is, is, is relatively small. Um, uh, so, you know, looking at fuel pumps, um, for example, and we may be just getting into the changes required in, in different areas, the, the EMS uh, hardware, software and, and calibration uh, is always um, very important. When we look at the high ethanol blends, then you know, more fundamental changes uh, are needed um, for durability when it comes to uh, valves and uh, valve seats, uh, potentially piston rings, um, increased flow um, for uh, fuel pumps um, and uh, injectors, um, and uh, 
uh, yeah, the materials compatibility um, issues that um, we always uh, need to be uh, very, very aware of. So finally, I want to just cover one other topic, which is the possibility of using ethanol uh, to gasoline um, fuels. Um, so we in uh, in Ricardo have been uh, doing some uh, research work uh, using a fuel um, from Coritin Advanced Fuels, which is a, a fuel supplier uh, in Europe. Um, and this is a, a fuel that's produced in two stages. So the, the first stage is uh, to produce a second generation um, advanced bioethanol uh, from waste um, biomass. Um, so in this case, this is coming from agricultural and forestry uh, wastes. Um, so this is the, the left hand side of the diagram on this slide. Um, the bioethanol is then uh, dehydrated into ethylene uh, and is then grown uh, into uh, longer chain hydrocarbons um, in the presence of uh, uh, zeolite catalysts. And that's the, the right hand side of the diagram. So the, the table on this slide is comparing the, the um, characteristics of um, a standard fossil uh, E10 gasoline and this uh, biomass to liquid uh, gasoline or biogasoline and you can see that you know the calorific value is very similar um, the RON is a little bit lower but it's, but it's similar um, distillation curve is, is a bit different but you know this is a, a drop-in um, fuel uh, but one in which is delivering uh, 80 percent uh, greenhouse gas uh, savings um, uh, using the uh, uh, RED2 definition, so that's the Renewable Energy Directive um, in, uh, in, in the European Union. Uh, and we've tested this uh, fuel in one of our um, advanced uh, research engines. So this is a, uh, yeah, a dedicated hybrid engine um, running lean uh, and using a um, using a pre-chamber um, combustion system and the combustion parameters are very similar uh, between the, the Euro 6 uh, fossil fuel, which is the orange color, uh, and then the bio uh, gasoline um, fuel, which is uh, the green color. So the burn angle is ignition to 10% mass refraction burn and 10 to 90% mass refraction burn are, are very, very um, similar between, between those fuels. Okay, so that brings me to the conclusions for this presentation. Um, so uh, we believe that mitigating climate change requires a portfolio um, of propulsion systems that address the existing fleet uh, as well as uh, new vehicles and that uh, I see engines um, using uh, sustainable fuels uh, such as ethanol. Um, should be part of this um, portfolio. So if we think about uh, propulsion system prime mover, we have obviously the established IC engines and we have uh, a growth in uh, e-machines in uh, uh, battery electric vehicles. Uh, in, in many markets, although we have to say not all, um, the uh, Renewable electricity uh, is growing, so it's making the use of battery electric vehicles uh, more sustainable. Uh, but we could achieve, you know, a, a, uh, exactly the same thing or an, an analogous thing with IC engines um, by using um, renewable fuels, and this leading us to uh, overall uh, net zero uh, mobility. Electrification is uh, actually a major opportunity for um, further development of um, engines uh, and Ricardo supporting uh, OEMs with uh, the design uh, development and um, systems integration for, um, for ethanol uh, fueled vehicles. 
So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions that we have now and also you can uh, keep in touch with us uh, uh, with the usual um, social media uh, channels or, or via our website. Thank you very much Dr. Osborne. Uh, you are able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. So you have taken up total CO2 reduction in totality so that you started with the electrical and then you came to ethanol and what are all the modifications to be done in the engine? For example, wall train system, your Miller cycle, you have a patent on Miller cycle. So you told the camshaft also to be modified and fuel tank, EMS system and fuel injection system. So uh, we could able to understand for ethanol economy, what are all the engine modifications required from your presentation? And you also demonstrated one engine, three cylinder, 1.5 liter gasoline engine with hybrid for CO2 reduction. So in totality, climate change was your topic in which ethanol, of course, you put e-fuel or e-economy. I take it as not electric, but as ethanol economy for today's presentation. Thank yes. you very much for your wonderful presentation. And so have you done many measurement during ethanol development? Do you yes. face any, yeah, any problem in measuring means what are all the corrections to be done in the equipment? What are all means ordinary measurement and ethanol vehicle measurement? Any difference in the instruments you are handled? I think from you know performance uh, and fuel economy um, perspective, the the equipment is the same. Um, mm. I think for the very detailed emissions measurements, uh, there are uh, some differences, and we um, yeah we heard yeah very detailed presentation on that from Kamarasan um, earlier in the session. Um, but basically, the tools are the same. Um, but you know some of the some of the details will be will be slightly different. Um, but when it comes to, yeah, to performance, uh, fuel economy, um, combustion, um, all of all of those things, uh, we're, we're using the same tools. Okay, thank you. So for emission, we will take the specialist for the same. Exactly. Uh, thank you. So if uh, any other question from the audience. I heard that audience are not able to ask question. I think they are putting only in chat box. That's why they are not able to ask question. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, are you able to uh, see the question section on your right, uh, Sadhgopalan sir? Are you able to see the question section uh, on the I right? Saw. Yes, yes. Yeah. There are only yes, two sir. questions. There are only two questions, which is for that is like. Uh, 100% ethanol vehicle, why there is no sales? So that is not related to this. And mm -hmm. for fuel economy losses, it is due to calorific value that I have a question for Dr. Osborne. Do you have any theoretical calculation? For example, E20 blend, how much CO2 will be reduced or increased? What is the fuel economy? Have you done simulations? That is yeah. the question there. Yeah, we have. I mean, so the you know the the tailpipe uh, CO two change is not is not large uh, in that case, but the the uh, so the tank to wheel uh, CO two change would would not be la large for uh, E twenty, uh, but the well to wheels um, uh, CO two will will definitely change, and that that's quite a complicated subject because it really depends where um the the ethanol is coming from and um so you know for example in the case of wastes uh, sort of second generation wastes there and there is a very large um co2 reduction from that you know in the case of crop um uh, crop based ethanol then it's it is a bit smaller um that, but uh, you know it depends on um, calculations of indirect land use uh, change and, and so on. So th th there's no sort of single answer um, uh, to that. Um, but 
you know de definitely there is a there is a co2 saving and that's why you know why it's in that's why it's important um from a from a climate perspective okay thank you very much that is a question from chantan kardelle of tata motors okay and great thank you question question. Is from ds kulkarni thank you great thank you so uh, if there is no other question in the chat box let me invite our next presenter uh, mr atelio siani from basf atelio siani from basf is there yes <clears throat> hello everyone ah uh, 14 years he got experience now we would like to hear what are all the chemicals coatings which will be suitable for ethanol vehicle? Welcome, Mr. Atelier Siani. Hello, hello. Uh, good yes, afternoon to are, everyone. You are audible. You are audible. Yes, uh, I think I need a release to share my screen as well. Could you kindly confirm you are seeing my screen, please? Yes, you are, your screen is visible. Very okay. good, you can continue your presentation. Thank you. Uh, so, um, thank you very much for the introduction. First of all, also, thank you uh, to the organizer, to the ICAT, to, to invite me for, uh, for this session. Uh, I am uh, from BASF and uh, one of the uh, divisions uh, in BASF is uh, taking care of uh, emission control system. So uh, what we do is uh, providing catalyst uh, to treat uh, exhaust gas out of, um, out of internal combustion engines. So from a variety of engine types, uh, diesel, gasoline, uh, smaller engine, larger engines. And uh, what I'm going to show today is um, our experience uh, treating um, exhaust uh, coming from engines which use ethanol 100% um, or ethanol blends um, together with gasoline. And that's, uh, that's the field here we're going to look at. So uh, if we go now into the, um, into the content, you have seen this slide uh, maybe in a different fashion, uh, but always um, pointing out um, that uh, there is a great uh, high ethanol, fuel ethanol production, uh, mostly from uh, US and, uh, and Brazil. And if we consider Brazil um, as such, it has a successful uh, biofuel program, which involves not only the production of the ethanol, but also the use of ethanol fuel. So for the next discussion, we'll take uh, Brazil um, and the challenges uh, involved with the um, Brazil regulation uh, for pollutants as a reference market uh, to give an example of uh, um, how to um, how to treat this type of exhaust and what are the challenges and also uh, the changes that we will see in the near uh, in the near future uh, for um, for the catalyst uh, for the catalyst development. So definitely, again, as pointed out in uh, in previous um, in previous presentation uh, from the presenter, uh, ethanol definitely offer a um, opportunity for sustainability, lower CO2 footprint, and uh, especially if we look uh, at uh, the well-to-wheel cycle. So this has been. Um, in the course of this session, um, so pointed out several times, um, and I will not go uh, go further into this, but we will go more uh, directly into the uh, into the Brazil uh, Brazil regulation and looking at the challenges. 
So here is our reference market. Um, what you see in the graph are on the y-axis, the milligram of um, per kilometer emission tailpipe allowed, and on the y uh, on the x-axis uh, is the year um, where the regulation is in place. Where we are now is uh, basically the end of uh, the PL6 or the LEV6 um, as called, um, where there is um, yeah, individual um, requirement for an NMHC and NOx and combined give 130 uh, milligram per kilometer. But what is important is not, uh, it's not really the number, but actually the drop uh, in uh, requirement or the higher, more stricter emission regulation, which uh, will go into effect with the uh, so-called um, PL7. So this is the significant drop, uh, around 40% uh, value less uh, emission allowed uh, from the tailpipe and this bring um, already a significant challenge to the definition of, uh, of the catalyst. There is also a change uh, looking at the hydrocarbon, no more looking at the non-methane uh, hydrocarbon, but um, given the, the higher uh, ethanol use in the fuel looking at um, non-methane organic, uh, organic gas or NMOG plus uh, NOx values here now uh, as a combined um, as a combined value, and then the challenge continues through the years as planned with the PL8 um, starting 2020 uh, 2025, basically with further reduction um, according to the uh, specific bin regulation over the years. Uh, when we talk about uh, this, uh, this tailpipe emission, uh, we need to talk about uh, also emission cycles, which are used to test um, to test the, the vehicles. Uh, in Brazil, is the FTP uh, 75, so taken from the, uh, let's say, example of the US regulation and uh, different certification fuels as well. So looking at the gasoline E22, um, the market fuel uh, at the lower um, ethanol content, then uh, the so-called 50-50 uh, mixture uh, is the E100 plus uh, E22 in a 50-50 ratio, and finally the E100 pure ethanol um, as a fuel. Pointing out this uh, because uh, yeah, we, uh, we need to provide, let's say, solution catalyst able to deal uh, with these uh, testing conditions and, uh, and fuel types. So this is, uh, let's say, defining the, defining the boundary, uh, the boundary condition of, um, of, our, um, of our definition work for a catalyst and development. Um, here also uh, some of the characteristics um, of different fuels, which uh, which then affect um, affect uh, the development work and uh, define the challenges. These have already uh, in the course of this session pointed out uh, a couple of times, but we will go through this quickly. On the uh, top left side, you see a small table looking at different air fuel ratio uh, between gasoline and uh, ethanol, um, a higher octane number for the ethanol, but more importantly, um, a lower uh, heat of combustion for ethanol compared to gasoline and a higher latent heat of evaporation uh, for ethanol uh, compared to gasoline. These, in turn, uh, give some challenges, which you can see an example here on the right side in this graph. This is uh, just the, the start of the FTP 75 uh, cycle. And you see uh, here reported on the y-axis on the left, uh, the hydrocarbon emission, which is uh, higher uh, for the ethanol E92, uh, so it's 92% ethanol uh, in this uh, in this fuel tested, uh, which gives a yeah, higher emission, uh, especially in the cold start, 
on the coastal phase compared to a gasoline. So definitely here uh, posing a challenge um, for the catalytic after treatment system, but also uh, for the control. Um, and we have seen this also in the previous uh, presentation, the EMS uh, needs also to be updated and take care of um, the different blends uh, of uh, ethanol in the fuel. So what has these uh, different properties um, as a consequence? Um, maybe there will be some uh, startup enrichment uh, requirement. There is a lower exhaust gas temperature, uh, which then contributes um, to a delayed light off. So meaning to a lower efficiency of uh, or lower temperature um, and then uh, lower efficiency at the same uh, time in the cycle of hydrocarbon conversion, which then brings basically a higher cold start uh, hydrocarbon emission as a challenge. Just uh, yeah, looking at the fuel. If uh, uh, we look at the system definition, um, and uh, the catalyst development challenges going to stricter emission regulation in our reference market here, the Brazil uh, market. We see the, the changes from PL7 to PL8 bring changes yeah, from non methane hydrocarbon to NMOC. Uh, the combination of these two uh, NMOC and NOx in one uh, combined limit, but also the increased in durability requirement uh, up to 60,000 kilometers from the 80,000 uh, which is in uh, in place now. And then uh, the fact that unburned ethanol, um, yeah there was a discussion uh, maybe earlier in the session, uh, now the unburned or for the PL7 the unburned ethanol cannot be deducted anymore from the NMOG and uh, uh, tighter OBD requirements. What does this mean uh, in terms of catalyst um, and catalyst definition for the um, for the exhaust after treatment? As we will see an increase in uh, catalytic volume, in catalyst volume, um, and how we will do this increase? Um, probably the change uh, from a close couple only um, system definition uh, to a close couple plus a second catalyst with closer to the engine, so-called close couple two, or farther from the engine, uh, so-called underflow. So definitely the presence of two um, catalyzed volumes uh, in the system. Another hot topic, uh, let's say, uh, besides the volume increase, um, is definitely the need for a higher um, PGM content. What is PGM? It's a uh, precious uh, group metal. Um, it is uh, for uh, for the catalyst definition, the platinum, palladium, and rhodium um, noble metals, which are used to to catalyze the hydrocarbon C oxidation as well as the NOx uh, NOx reduction during uh, during the cycle. So we will see uh, through this tighter regulation uh, an increase in content, which also means uh, um, a higher cost pressure uh, for this uh, for this system. And uh, let's say last but not least, um, as we already touched um, earlier, uh, some calibration improvements uh, which are needed to um, solve the challenge, for example, of the cost start, um, cost start hydrocarbon. Yeah, so what are uh, um, we doing um, as a company uh, to uh, to look at different um, options and uh, provide the best options for the catalytic after treatment system? Uh, so there is, um, of course, a continuous uh, work stream of uh, technology improvement, which means technology of the catalytic activity of the so-called three-way catalyst and uh, 
uh, four-way catalyst or FWC, um, which means the catalyzed uh, filter, particulate filter. So this is, uh, is something that um, this division in BSF has been doing for uh, maybe the past uh, 30 plus years. And this, um, this won't stop. Um, a more uh, acute, uh, let's say, issue we see right now is uh, the precious metal price uh, development. And here you see the, yeah, the, the price development of platinum, palladium, and rhodium, or the so-called PGMs, uh, over the past uh, eight, nine years. And uh, what you definitely see is, uh, is the purple line, uh, very prominent uh, for the rhodium price development, having an exponential increase um, starting around 2017, 19, at 1718 uh, up to up to today to very high uh, to very high level as well as um, the increase of palladium price relative to to platinum price which we experienced in the past uh, in the past couple of years so what uh, what is uh, now changing for the catalyst is that uh, the catalyst uh, after treatment solution in order to be uh, cost effective needs to take care of this um, uh, different ratios of price ratio between the precious metals. So it needs to be constantly uh, developed and adapted to uh, the market, the regulation, the fuel challenges, but also to the uh, precious metal price so that um, yeah, it can remain uh, cost competitive is, as possible. And uh, how to do that? Um, so uh, as BSF, we are um, the, with the emission, uh, mission control division, we are active globally um, in the major markets. So North and South America, uh, Europe and uh, Asia, uh, including uh, of course, uh, India where we uh, can leverage uh, can leverage the learning uh, the learning worldwide of what is uh, what is best for for the regulation and uh, and the market mm -hmm. and uh, here one example um, which uh, which I would like to bring is uh, uh, during our uh, validation or the validation process of new catalysts for uh, PL7, uh, PL7 regulation, uh, you see two, two examples, two sets of bars. Uh, on the left side, uh, you see the emission, um, NMOG plus uh, uh, NOx of uh, the um, test with the E100 fuel where you see uh, that the, let's say, standard PL6 uh, catalyst uh, is not, um, is just barely touching the, the uh, PL7 limits, not giving much buffer for, uh, uh, um, for engineering safety. While, uh, uh, so with the development of um, a trimetal catalyst, which includes also uh, platinum, in the, in the formulation, uh, substituted uh, by so substituting palladium, we were able to achieve uh, some mission safety uh, relative to the limits and be below uh, the target, as well as uh, giving some uh, um, some cost reduction potential. A, uh, the same catalyst tested uh, under the E22, uh, E22 fuel give, uh, um, give a safe margin, very much safe margin relative to the emission limits, but also here uh, giving opportunity for, uh, for cost reduction. All of this, uh, when, when we look at uh, emission validation, we need to do this uh, under uh, um, durability requirements. And what we have seen here is uh, the durability test or the test done after the full uh, the full durability cycle. 
um, which is then um, required uh, also by the regulation. So here giving uh, the, the possibility to uh, or opportunity to uh, meet uh, emission regulation and uh, also uh, depending on PGM price, some, uh, some cost advantage opportunity. So with which other different tool, what are the tools uh, we use for the catalyst development? Uh, so we have talked, uh, we have seen today uh, several, uh, uh, several examples of uh, um, vehicle testing uh, and engine bench testing. Of course, we, we do this um, to, to validate the catalyst in uh, um, full size under, uh, let's say, the most real condition possible, representing or reflecting test requirements. That's what we do on the left side. Um, and uh, here we also take advantage of the global footprint of BSF, uh, having uh, several um, engine laboratories uh, in the in the regions worldwide. But what we also have are um, synthetic uh, gasoline simulators or synthetic vehicle simulators. These are um, advanced reactors uh, where the vehicle trays, uh, emission vehicle trays in, uh, can be quick, uh, quickly uh, implemented and uh, uh, simulated, which allows for a very quick catalyst screening and uh, evaluation. And why this is important? Um, it is important, especially for, for the ethanol, um, for the ethanol question, because um, we can simulate different ethanol blends or uh, look in a specific uh, reactivity of um, exhaust, uh, exhaust components on the catalyst technology uh, from, um, from these uh, reactors, uh, so dynamic reactors, which give both an idea of uh, um, what is the reactivity, what is the best technology for uh, uh, emission conversion, and gives also an idea for uh, engines and fuels that maybe, um, or exhaust composition that do not exist uh, really, but that we can uh, modify with some degree of freedom um, in, a, in a lab reactor. So this gives an additional, uh, let's say, an additional tool or an additional possibility to uh, to find the best um, the best technology um, for for the application and uh, and the market. So and this brings me uh, yeah, already to the uh, to the conclusion of this short presentation. So definitely we see that uh, stringent emission regulation will, uh, will come into effect, uh, already planned, and uh, this will require more efficient uh, catalyst emission control system. And uh, in order to, to develop this, uh, we need to develop also tools and evaluation protocols um, to screen our catalysts under the, these demanding uh, conditions or demanding scenarios. We will have the topic of uh, the thermal durability and longer durability requirement. This is maybe a topic which is uh, global. Uh, let's say it's not only um, ethanol specific or it's definitely not Brazil specific and not ethanol specific, but we have the, the very specific uh, topic of fuel condition and, uh, and vehicle requirements. And for this, we need, uh, we need the flexibility of testing and tools. And uh, given the BSF global global footprint, uh, what we what we are doing is definitely leverage uh, the expertise worldwide and uh, looking at the uh, market requirements, but also at the other boundary conditions, for example, the PGM price uh, development to uh, to be able uh, um, to provide the best uh, the best solution. Yeah, and with this, uh, I would say. Thank you very much uh, for, your, for your attention and uh, happy to answer any question you might have. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, doctor. And the uh, doctor is uh, from doctorate from South Carolina University. 
and you raised the right point that delayed light off that's why this catalyst uh, concentration should be there today we came to know that delayed light off will be there higher precious metal will be there and i have to add one more catalytic converter by not importing the crude or energy security i am going to import your platinum precious metal as well as the catalyst because it is also not manufactured in india precious metals and catalyst so in order to use ethanol we are going to face some more imports maybe based on your presentation because the unburnt okay. ethanol to be treated nmog to be treated increased catalyst volume is a must and of course uh, basf can do innovation and reduce few precious metal list otherwise cost will be very high am i right doctor um yes so the so definitely a change uh, so a change in fuel with the more ethanol blends will bring these challenges um relative to the import so th there is uh, there is production of catalysts in in india so this uh, so maybe uh, you can delete from the import list um <laughs> so the it, it is available uh, but definitely there would be uh, there would be a topic on um, um yeah how to manage uh, how to manage the after treatment system so to to do that um so what what i try to show uh, here is uh, there is uh, uh, there is a market reference um, and there, are, there is already experience which uh, is possible to be leveraged uh, for the introduction of this uh, fuel um, in india so that uh, uh, the challenge is there but um, you can see that there are already some some solution of course uh, so the the let's say the the train does not stop here yeah? there is there is continuous development uh, so that uh, that and the, the target is to use as uh, less precious metal as possible and of course reduce the total cost of ownership uh, for uh, for the after treatment system uh, to the oem and finally to the um, final customer driving the car so this is uh, this is happening but thank yeah, you as, as you mentioned yes. the challenges thank you are, very are there. Much. Yeah. no thank no you. you can research on low temperature catalyst so that is a homework of course, for you. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Please. Okay. Thank you very much. There are two more speakers. We have crossed a lot of time, but still on the interest of ethanol economy. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Coppers from AVL, then Srinath, uh, Kishan Srinath from uh, Volvo India. There are two more speakers. So Dr. Coppers from AVL, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And he got 31 years of experience in AVL. So without uh, leaving any time, I leave to you. Please, Dr. Paul, on the floor is yours. So, oh, can you see Thank my? Thank you. Screen? You are audible now. No. Can you hear them? You are audible. Yes, we are audible. Can you see the screen? Uh, no, not it. No, we huh? can see the screen. We, we can, can see, see the, the screen. screen. Okay. 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 No issue. So, then let's start. Uh, as an introduction, we have already seen that we have this roadmap that is planned uh, for India to move to ethanol. And ethanol has quite some uh, advantages in terms of uh, combustion, uh, flame temperature, and so on. And no particulate emission or very low soot emission. The residual is coming mainly from oil. But there are also some challenges, and I will also focus on these ones like cold start capability, mechanical implications, and also pre-ignition. Uh, we have quite a wide project experience on flex fuel, so more than 20 years of uh, experience on flex fuel engines, ethanol engines, uh, up to uh, SOP programs. And this experience is not only, but mainly from Brazil, so we run there uh, a tech center in Brazil, close to Sao Paulo, since 2014. Uh, and we have a full test equipment uh, with engine dynos and the climatic uh, chassis dyno there. So we have quite a long history in this flex fuel development 
that we can use. So now what are the challenges that we face um, with uh, ethanol? This is a bit of a list uh, showing some plus and minuses. So definitely the, the more ethanol we add, so this is starting from E10, E20, E100, uh, the better everything gets in terms of combustion. Uh, we can run higher compression ratio. Uh, we can run less enrichment or run completely lambda one at full load, but we also for sure see higher cylinder pressures. Um, we have a lower flame temperature, but we might have higher thermal flux on the cylinder head. So we have earlier ignition, higher cylinder pressures, but a lot more cooling from the fuel. We already heard that the more ethanol we add, the lower is the calorific value of the fuel due to the oxygen. One third is oxygen. We have the cold start issues, and I will focus a bit on that one, how to solve that. We have to look at uh, composition of the fuel with regard to cold start, oil dilution, blow by, diagnosis, and stuff like this. Uh, latent heat of evaporation, which is good for knocking, it's not good for cold starting. And we have all this uh, oxidation issue with regard to fuel system and ignition system. And on top of that, we have the topic of pre ignition. That means ethanol is quite sensitive to surface ignition, so hot components. The problem is we can't see that with a normal knock control. It might happen that we have just very early combustion, but not the typical knocking noise that we can hear uh, with a knock sensor. So knock detection in terms of pre-ignition is a bit of a topic. Now, when we look at oil dilution, and this is a nice sequence of oil samples that you see down here, um, we have high fuel flow demand, we have our cold start issues, we have a single um, fuel uh, with not really an ev evaporation line, but with, a, with an evaporation point. Uh, that might lead to things like very limited use of uh, stop-start system. So you see that the oil gets into this emulsion, but you can get rid of this water and ethanol by some heat treatment, so when the engine is getting warm. Now, what is the issue with this evaporation of the fuel? And this is a, a measurement uh, looking at the air-fuel ratio or the lambda control in the warm-up phase. So you see that in a quite narrow range of temperature, we see this dip in the lambda control that basically means that this ethanol at this temperature evaporates uh, and the lambda controller has to correct for that. That means we have to be careful in that area with diagnosis, but also uh, with adaption, for instance, uh, to the fuel uh, itself. There are so, uh, quite some impacts on the uh, base engine, cylinder running surface, piston rings, crank pins, main journals, timing drive, valve train, valve seats, especially. I have an example uh, later on that one. For sure, it depends on how the base engine looks like, what has to be modified. Uh, we also see impacts on blow-by system, cylinder head material. It, again, it depends on what is the base material. Uh, things like corrosion, uh, layout of turbo machinery, injection systems, spark plugs, ceilings and gaskets, mainly on the chemical side. But also thermal and corrosion issues on uh, periphery on lambda sounds, on gaskets. We have to look at uh, oil quality sensors uh, to check uh, the quality of the oil, especially with regard to things like this uh, oil dilution issue that we have seen uh, before, also tank system, filters and fuel pumps. Now, these are some few examples of what is happening uh, when we start uh, to use ethanol. So we might need different kind of uh, piston rings uh, we see different uh, thermal flux in the cylinder head. I already said where it's coming from. It might be simply coming from uh, earlier ignition because the fuel leads to a better detonation borderline. Uh, we have this issue of valve seat wear. Just to give you an example, we have developed an engine some time ago and after 100 hours of use of that engine, there was a valve seat wear of one millimeter. So it's quite significant. So we have to check which kind of valve seed material we use in order to get durable. We have this peak firing pressure increase. So this diagram gives you about the feeling 
what we could end up with, so something like more than 120 bar uh, peak pressure if we want to push for it. For sure, we can also go for less pressure and I will show some examples afterwards what happens then. Now, what are possible solutions against uh, all these uh, challenges that we face? Um, we already heard that uh, there was some use of gasoline cold start systems. This is a rather simple example, or already several years old, uh, that we used some time ago. So it wasn't even an injector for gasoline. That was just some simple orifices so that during cranking and during uh, the first warm-up phase, the engine was running mainly on gasoline with a quite simple device. Um, now in Brazil, um, it's a moving a bit away from this gasoline system and more towards things like heated injectors and heated fuel rails. That would also be the solution uh, that we would go for in India. Uh, so we see these injectors with um, uh, additional uh, connectors. Uh, we can have a certain preheating uh, phase of this injector to heat up the fuel. Then we have the injection. Uh, we have the cranking phase and then we can ha have a quick run up of the engine despite starting at something like minus 5 or down to minus 10 degrees. For sure, MPI engines, and this is an example of an MPI engine, is a bit more difficult uh, than GDI engines. On GDI engines, and this is also some kind of a benchmark coming from Brazil with different strategies for cold start, on GDI, we inject directly into the cylinder, which makes life a bit easier if we do it correctly. And correctly means you see quite a big difference when, we, when you get down to lower temperatures on E100 startability, uh, that with the correct strategy, you can easily start at minus 10 degree. Whereas when you have the wrong strategy, probably it takes a while until the engine fires up. Now, what is the correct strategy? And this is an example um, of how we develop these strategies. This is a, a single cylinder engine uh, with a glass uh, cylinder liner. So we can directly look into the cylinder and see what is happening in there. Uh, and you see that we can freeze that engine. So we can run it uh, really cold. And we use that to develop a strategy for E100 cold start. So actually, when we start with a certain sequence, uh, low pressure injection like an MPFI, big droplets, a lot of the droplets are attached to the wall. Uh, when we increase the fuel pressure, so in this case 40 bar, the droplets are getting smaller. We have more droplets in the air and less on the wall. And finally, what we ended up is some kind of a multiple injection strategy. So small, fine droplets injected in a way that they don't impinge on the valve, they don't impinge on the liner throughout the aspiration and compression stroke so that the droplets are staying in the air and the heat of compression actually evaporates the fuel, although the air is cold in the aspiration stroke and this leads uh, to a safe cold start. Another point is, as I said, uh, detection of uh, pre-ignition. There are several solutions. This is a, a quite specific one I want to show here as an example. Uh, so you can use this ion current detection uh, to find out whether you have a normal combustion. So the, the ion current signal has a characteristic trace and you can detect the knocking cycle where you see a certain change of the ion current signal. But even if you have the typical behavior of an ethanol engine, where you have a very early increase of pressure, but not the typical oscillations that you see knocking with this characteristic shape of the ion current trace, you can even detect this kind of phenomenon on a pure ethanol engine. Now, what could we do in addition to that uh, when we go for flex fuel? Uh, one nice technology is millerization or running Atkinson. Uh, the difference is early or late uh, intake closing. Basically, what we want to achieve when we go from a standard intake closing to a Miller intake closing, you now reduce pressure and temperature in the aspiration and end of compression, and that limits knocking. So what we could do is we could run a rather high compression ratio with some kind of a normal intake closing on ethanol with, with its high uh, run capability and use millerization to let the engine run safely 
also on RON 95. So this is a nice technology uh, for flex fuel engines. Not to forget about things like uh, software. We heard about that already uh, today. So we need some new software functions. We need some adaptive uh, software functions. For instance, ethanol sensors. You could either use a sensor or a virtual sensor. Uh, we are working on a, on a virtual sensor. Uh, so to detect even during refueling uh, whether we have ethanol or E20 or whatever in the tank without having a specific sensor. Uh, we have a specific model for fuel in oil absorption and desorption. Uh, as I already mentioned, we need for a cold start specific strategies for GDI. Typically, it's this multiple uh, injection and specific phasing for MPI. It's heated fuel rail or injector tip. And we also need uh, specific maps uh, for different kinds of fuels. Now let's look a bit uh, uh, about what happens when we run um, E25 or E100 or E85 uh, to the engine. At, at first, this is a comparison of DSFC maps. Um, so what you see is, as already mentioned today, that in terms of grams per kilowatt hour with E100, we are significantly higher than what we see on E25. This for sure is due to the lower calorific value. Uh, when we correct that, so we correct both the measurements to a standard uh, E0 fuel, you see that we could even get a bit better efficiency on E100 than what we have on E25. Uh, there was also quite some discussion about uh, emissions, so I put uh, one chart for emissions in there. In engine out emission, E100 can be better than E25. It is already mentioned before that, especially in cold start, it is still a challenge because of the cold temperatures and of the light off behavior of the catalyst. Now, if we look at, at full load behavior, we already heard uh, that with uh, E100 compared to E25, we can have higher full load. This is from a naturally aspirated engine. So we see a certain increase in torque and power. Where does it come from? Basically, it comes from an earlier combustion phasing. So 50% uh, mass fraction burned is significantly earlier. Actually, it's around uh, MVT. But we also see that we have a higher fuel flow uh, with ethanol due to this uh, lower calorific value. Uh, when we come to uh, charged engines, we can do different strategies. Uh, that would be a strategy saying we use uh, equal torque and equal spark at once. So basically it says we do nothing. We try to achieve the same torque, the same power, and we use even the same spark at once for ethanol uh, and for RON95. What happens for sure as before the fuel consumption goes up. And we also see that in this case, the combustion is a bit retarded. So when we run uh, the same spark at once, we could end up even with a later combustion phasing for ethanol uh, compared to gasoline. If we use the benefits of ethanol, and this is an example, uh, we can use uh, earlier spark timings uh, like shown here, and then it typically depends on the allowed peak pressure. So these are examples at around 90 and 100 bar allowed peak pressure. And you see the more peak pressure we allow, the earlier we can go in combustion phasing, the earlier we can go uh, in ignition timing. Um, fuel consumption gets a bit better. And also we can increase power depending on peak pressure. So this is one of the topics uh, that we have to lead uh, during the development of these flex fuel engines. How much do we want to utilize the benefits of ethanol? And finally, as we discussed about uh, dedicated hybrid engines, I also want to show what could be the future of whatever fueled engine, gasoline, ethanol, e-fuel. Uh, this is our last uh, demonstrator vehicle with an extremely efficient engine, dedicated hybrid engine. We already heard that. Uh, and this is a 2.5 liter inline four engine with 45% uh, uh, peak efficiency, so less than 190 grams per kilowatt hour uh, BSFC. Uh, you see the map uh, down here, and it uses some uh, very specific features, electric turbocharger, specific combustion system with three spark plugs, insulated exhaust manifold, and so on. 
So this could be also a nice future once we have established this ethanol economy in India. So this concludes uh, my presentation. Um, if there are any questions, uh, just let me know. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaupas. It's a very long time and lot of presentations. And one more presentation is there because already we have crossed our timeline. However, uh, you have made up since you are from a core R&D house, you have clearly explained what are all the core engine design challenges like a high compression ratio. Even though you got a RON is very high, high knock resistance is there. We need to resolve that and cold start will be a problem. And one more point you mentioned is oil dilution and blow by where some issues to be sorted out. And uh, even though later need of vaporization is there, it assists burning, but not for cold start. And uh, surface ignition sensitivity also you have raised. So it means a lot of engine design aspects to be seen after learning from your presentation. And wall seat wear is to be looked into it, but it might be wall seat wear in dry CNG wall seat may be useful for this. And for the knock, very difficult to predict the knock. So you asked us to use ion current deduction. I would say and, this is a chance. It's not necessarily required. Mm. So in most of the engines in Brazil, they are using the knock detection for the gasoline operation and they run peak mm. pressure limited on E100. So not, not a lot of engines are okay. using that ion current detection. I said this is one example how to do it. Uh, there are also other possibilities. Okay. Okay, other possibilities, but uh, if you want higher power, you have to put more fuel and advanced timing, correct? Yes, at which time we should take care of. You have to look at, at heat flux and peak pressure and stuff like this to avoid this surface ignition. And uh, thanks for your confidence on Miller cycle. So we will be using Miller cycle to balance the temperature rise and control the knock. But of course, we have go for higher compression ratio, three spark plugs, totally a dedicated engine to be made for ethanol. Am I right? I would say this is probably the future. Most most probably at the beginning, there will be some kind of a minimum change approach, taking the engines that are existing and modify them that you can operate them on, on ethanol. I just wanted to show that the development of the combustion engine hasn't ended. So there is still a future for that um, going for even higher efficiencies in the future. Yes, thanks, thanks up to thermal efficiency, 45%. Very, very inspiring presentation, Dr. Koppers. Hope a full audience would have enjoyed this technical presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Since uh, there are a few questions and uh, since the time is out, I will be sending the questions later on. Let me call uh, Dr. Kishan Srina so that which is the last presentation we will have it. And so Kishan Srina is from Volvo Diesel, has wide experience in Volvo Diesel. Uh, without wasting much time, the floor is yours, Kishan, please. Thank you. I hope you can hear me and uh, can you see my screen? Yes. yes, your screen is visible. We could hear you. Sorry, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let me let me make it very quick. And in the interest of time, um, we we really have uh, exceeded, I think. So in the interest of time, I'll make it very uh, very quick. Thank you, Krishna uh, and uh, Mandel. We are not able to see the presentation. Uh, this uh, can you put on slide mode? I think the program is being displayed, not the presentation. Yeah, now we yeah. can see. Now, now we can see. Thank now, you. Right. Okay. Thank you for confirming. Okay. Is it still visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And I'll be speaking about the ethanol economy as an international experience uh, based out of uh, Volvo. And I think as Christian, uh, you mentioned before, 
Uh, there has been a lot of research on this topic in, in Europe, and um, my aim is to cover a bit of the perspective which we see within, within the Volvo Group. Uh, to, to begin with, I think as many of our speakers already have talked, uh, our goal is to move towards fossil-free transport solutions, and, and, and we believe that uh, the transportation will be fossil-free to a large extent by 2050 in accordance with the, with the Paris Agreement. So, um, in again, in addition to electrification and hydrogen economies, uh, which, which is also something we are pursuing extensively, uh, alternate fuels will continue to play a significant role for our customers uh, in order to reduce the CO2 emissions. So here, uh, basically what, uh, what we are looking at is uh, our, our signpost, if you may call it, is that uh, the climate issues are among the, the major challenges of our times. And uh, these will require a joint effort from both corporate sector and public agencies uh, in order to be more effective. And, and of course, transport industry plays a crucial role in development of the society and its economy. Uh, so Volvo Truck also has no hesitation in admitting that we are part of the problem here and, and we would we would like to really find out solutions which can bring modern transport uh, solutions into the sustainable future. So what we will do in the next slide is describe or discuss about the various pros and cons of different alternate fuels as we have seen it and as we have experienced it. And, and the importance of the holistic view is what I'm trying to cover here uh, in the sense that how will each of these fuel segments uh, support us in our uh, journey towards being carbon neutral. Uh, in this slide, basically what we what we see is that while we are evaluating the various alternate fuels, uh, we, we see that there are broadly two, two types of energy sources. One, one of the energy sources derived from the fossil fuels themselves, whereas the other source is coming from the renewable energies. And uh, ethanol, in this case, basically is a pure re renewable fuel made by fermenting of crops and starch and sugar. So, so pretty much I think it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, source uh, from the renewable uh, raw materials. So when we are looking at these uh, factors, what we are also trying to focus is, as I told, the holistic view uh, in different segments. And, and in the next few slides, I plan to cover those very segments, like what's the climate impact of each fuel variant, what's the energy efficiency, the land use efficiency, the fuel potential, the vehicle adaptation, the fuel cost, and the fuel infrastructure. And it's also important to recognize here that there are many other different criteria to, to consider, but, but these are some of the ones which, which will really help us to be uh, a bit more uh, focused on the holistic approach. And a complete evaluation of each of the alternate fuels uh, will include all aspects of a sustainability perspective, including the, including the social factors. So looking at looking at the climate impact, if we if we look at an equivalent of a CO2 emission for complete well to wheel chain, what we see in the chart is basically a, a reduction or increase of an equivalent CO2 emission compared with let's say the conventional diesel fuel. And and per se, when we look at it in a in a larger context, the non fossil CO2 emissions are not included because they do not produce a net increase in the atmospheric CO2 as as it has been covered by the previous speakers. So what we have done here is that the greenhouse gas emissions have been reported as CO2 equivalents. In other words, the, the sort of emissions from, uh, from the greenhouse gases other than carbon dioxide are converted into the equivalent uh, CO2. And this is in accordance with the market-based methods defined by the World Resource, uh, Resource Institute of the uh, GHG protocol. So, so in this case, again, if you see, the, the best case is uh, when we generate ethanol from a, from a waste product like uh, coming out of a paper mill or a pro potato processing unit or, or a brewery. Uh, but also the worst case can be coming out of useful ingredients like corn or wheat or sugar cane, which are, which are mostly the predominant crops, which, which also are fit for consumption. So, so there are a lot of variation uh, exists there depending on how we source these fuels. And uh, so this graph is basically showing that when we source responsibly uh, the raw materials to produce ethanol, I think ethanol as a fuel has, has sort of uh, a very similar climate impact footprint, footprint when we compare to the other fuel alternatives. Uh, when we move on to the, to the energy efficiency, again, here we look at sort of the well to wheel energy utilization. The, the energy efficiency is expressed as uh, a percentage indicating the proportion of energy reaching the vehicles uh, driven wheels. 
And for the purpose of comparison, uh, it may be noted that the, the fossil diesel oil, which we use today, delivers an overall efficiency of, of an average of about 35 percent. And, and, and the relatively high value of this is due to the fact that, that crude oil may be uh, regarded as a, as a semi-finished product. So in this case, again, uh, looking at the results for the same fuel may vary de depending on the type of production process and the feedstock which we use. And when we look at ethanol in, in particular, ethanol fares almost the same level as most of the other alternatives, barring let's say biodiesel or the HEO. And, and with the easy available uh, access to the, to the feedstock, I think uh, uh, HVO also shows more promise, but then, uh, but then ethanol can definitely uh, comparable, be comparable in the scenario depending on where we source the, the materials from. Also, when it comes to the, to the land use efficiency, uh, scarcity of land resources uh, makes the efficient use of land a very important issue. And I think it has been a lot of debate uh, across the world about how do we use our uh, scarce resource here. And uh, this is an important factor uh, considering that there's an ever, ever growing demand for both food and fuel. So when we look at the driving distance per hectare per year uh, as a measure here for the performance of biofuel, the data shown here can be very different based on the, on the geographical location and the, the crop type. And uh, so this is typically done out of the European conditions. So what you, whatever you're seeing here is, is based on the analysis we have done in the European regions. And the use of uh, the co-products from, uh, from fuel production has a significant impact on the result. So, so if the co-products are used uh, based on animal or food for energy purposes, then of course you have a higher uh, ratio of land utilization. Uh, all the alternate fuels compare well if you look at it in isolation. And looking at the complete value chain for ethanol, biodiesel, and other plant-based fuels, the distance per hectare uh, based on the biomasses and gases actually fare, fare better. And, and the reason being that the fossil fuel or the other equivalent energy inputs uh, also uh, is quite high. And if you really subtract this from the total quantity produced, then, then we see sort of a picture which is, which is quite good actually for, for ethanol usage. When we look at fuel potential, uh, the amount of fuel that can be produced considerably varies depending on the, the particular option we select and the availability of raw material and the choice of uh, production depends on the process which we want to follow there. And some of the biofuel processes can use many different uh, feedstock and, and complete crop, whereas others are limited to individual crops and uh, and of course, here at Volvo, we believe that the total amount of, of fossil fuel that can replace biomass is also varying depending on the efficiency of fuel production process and its uh, and its induced. And and the result shows that the the biomass potential actually will not be really sufficient to replace uh, fossil fuels in the foreseeable future. And and that's why we are also looking at looking at other alternatives, like as Dr. Richard told, uh, regarding electricity and hydrogen being produced out of. Uh, out of renewable sources and and just like in the previous slide when we when we look at these biofuels based on feedstock uh, they compare pretty much similarly and and extensively uh, they are dependent on the availability of raw materials and and if you look at this figure again from the uh, point of view of how much energy is, is needed for for let's say typical transport activity in europe uh, say about 4500 terawatt hour by 2030 what we see is that the, the amount of coverage from each fuel uh, alternative can be, can be quite scaled up and, uh, and also the maximum potential depends on which one fuel is produced using the same feedstock. So, uh, so that's again a discussion which is probably taking, uh, taking place at a larger context. Uh, when it comes to vehicle adaptation, different fuels require different types of vehicle adaptation. I think this has also been covered in the previous talks and the overall assessment, what we see is that uh, the techn technology com complexity of adapting the vehicles to use to new fuels is always a point of discussion. And this assessment includes various parameters like vehicle efficiency, the maximum engine performance, uh, the increased weight and range of refueling. So for example, the range of refueling will, will definitely affect the vehicle payload because we need to carry more fuel in, in case it's not very efficient. And the complexity of adaptation includes factors that necessitate 
um, additional fuel storage capacity. It requires new and more expensive components as well as technologies to meet the future future emission standards. So specific to ethanol, again, if we see what we what we have rated in Volvo is basically that it's it's a four, which means that it's it's suitable for more of most applications. Uh, and we don't see that we need uh, we need extensive or expensive vehicle adaptation to be done for using ethanol as a fuel. When it comes to fuel cost, we talk about well to tank uh, production cost, and uh, the evaluation includes raw material cost, the fixed and variable production cost, the transport and infrastructure cost, and the cost of energy utilization along the complex distribution chain. And uh, in general, the future costs are uh, difficult to predict due to fluctuations in, in raw material prices and, and also due to the rapid pace of uh, technology development. And in many cases, the, the cost of producing fuel is, is just a small part of the, the, the price which the end user pays for, for the fuel. And um, in these examples, basically what we see is that the cost of the particular fuel is compared with that of a conventional diesel oil assuming uh, an average crude, crude price of about 100 USD per barrel. And the, the comparison is made on per liter equivalent basis, which means that over a liter of a fuel, uh, which is required in some cases to, to obtain the same amount of energy content as a liter of diesel. And the, the result for the same fuel may vary depending on, again, the type of uh, input which goes into manufacturing the fuel itself. And produce responsibly again, we see that ethanol fares better than other alternatives in terms of uh, fuel cost increase in terms of again percentages. Uh, when we look at fuel infrastructure involving both handling and distribution, we see infrastructure is an important criteria in terms of how quickly and easily a new fuel can be produced and integrated with the existing systems. And uh, the integration, as we see here, is often regarded as a major challenge. To, to introduce any alternate fuel, which includes ethanol. And, and since the infrastructure for conventional fuel is also in continuous need of major investments and reforms, I think we, we look at infrastructure actually as a secondary issue uh, compared to the other ones uh, in the longer run. And, and specific to ethanol, we see that it ranks at three, um, meaning that we need major changes in, in handling. And I think this has also been covered in the previous talks about the issues about of how how we need to take care of ethanol as a part of infrastructure and transportation. So um, a holistic view, I think here, um, and cooperation are key for success. Um, we need to look at all the different parameters before evaluating a particular fuel for its use case. And all the fuels described in the stock, including ethanol, have a great potential to reduce climate emissions. And uh, from a transport industry point of view, this is quite a significant uh, thing for us. And as one of the world's leading manufacturers, we are, we are willing and able to shoulder our share of responsibilities for, for climate issues uh, by developing engines and, and designing them for, for the new alternate fuels. And, and as we have seen so far, all of these fuels have their own set of advantages and disadvantages. And choosing the fuels for the future requires uh, a complete cooperation between all the players and, and also, as I told, holistic approach. And from a technology point of view, uh, Volvo Truck has already demonstrated our ability to, to develop vehicles for all the fuel options which we have discussed in this presentation. However, the development of uh, CO2 neutral transport will not happen on its own. And we need to make sure that the, the active participation from the government agencies and the fuel producers in different regions are, are quite available for us to, to explore that opportunity further. And um, the availability of biofuels like ethanol is a, is a crucial factor for the complete value stream to work. And if the current, current production uh, resources are expanded rapidly, we see that availability uh, will, be, will be there uh, for, for use case, even though it may be limited for a number of years to come before we really scale up the economy for its own. So that's uh, that's basically what I was planning to cover. Uh, sorry if I had rushed through the presentation in the interest of time. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. In fact, uh, as a summary, you made a point for climate impact, how this ethanol economy also will add to CO2 reduction. And you compared very well the well to wheel. Of course, if well to wheel is not compared, the CO2 varies between the worst to best and energy efficiency is 35%. You brought very important point is vehicle adaptation will be very high. 
that means uh, you, you have to use more fuel payload will be there in fact lot of negative point is there i feel that brazil is having this because everybody is having ethanol when you compare with gasoline diesel cng then ethanol may not be a best bet and it is very difficult for the transition based on the difficulties you have expressed because most expensive adaptation this is a single word i got from the presentation we will run through it anyhow thank you very much for your wonderful presentation i will hand over to pamala madam madam this is for you floor is for you thank you ma'am please unmute sorry uh, thank you mr krishnan it has been a very very long session but i guess uh, the session was so interesting that i don't think people logged out of this session each and every presentation which was brought in here with so much of diverse experience uh, which will help uh, indian industry uh, to take uh, key takeaways on how to achieve the goals of sustainability how to achieve the goals of self reliance and be energy independent there are very good points which have been covered yesterday uh, in the uh, uh, both in the panel discussion as well as in the uh, presentations that were made and also it has come out very uh, uh, definitely from the presentation that has been made today that each country has to develop an energy policy based on the energy sources available locally in the country so that the energy independency can be achieved hence we need to have uh, solutions which are based on uh, local energy sources there was a point touched upon yesterday that the energy policy should cover all possible energy sources while everybody knows that the ultimate energy source for transportation is uh, going to be hydrogen but there is a definite pathway to achieve that objective it cannot be achieved overnight so we have to cross those Uh, milestones to reach to the ultimate hydrogen economy scenario uh, the presentations that have been made today brought out very key important points that we have to consider uh, you know uh, we have to tread the path of adoption of ethanol economy with caution uh, mr banerji talked about uh, 1g 2g i had only heard 1g 2g 3g 4g 5g in mobile uh, sector itself now the ethanol economy is also talking of 1g 2g and also possibility of 3g ethanol development uh, mr um, nakamura san brought out very lucid points on what are the challenges going to be in terms of emission measurement and the kind of possible modifications in infrastructure that will be required uh, for measurement and testing and also development of uh, ethanol based vehicles Uh, the uh, differences on the uh, regulated and unregulated emissions both in us and europe has also been brought out and we need to understand what kind of methodology we need to adopt because there will be cost entail for modifications in the infrastructure uh, susana brought in a very important uh, learning on their experimentation of Uh, having an ethanol blend of 5 to 20% and also a flex fuel vehicle and she brought out that uh, it is very important that we have the right kind of vehicle for a right kind of fuel yesterday also it was discussed in uh, panel discussion that while the country is embarking on e15 e20 e10 uh, fuel economy ethanol economy but we have to at the same time understand the vehicles which are already plying on roads how will those vehicles be catered to how how will those vehicles uh, you know adapt or face problems at the end of the day the customer should not face any issues while moving from one fuel to another fuel it should be a smooth transition as a user as a customer and also as a policy implementation perspective also uh mr banerji uh, a very good presentation on the kind of infrastructure the oil marketing companies are gearing up for producing um, uh, ethanol uh, locally and also what kind of transportation and logistic arrangements have been made uh, i'm sure uh, with uh, such uh, oil giants uh, uh, being in the foray of the uh, ethanol economy Uh, those challenges will already be met and there must be a road map for implementation of the same mr nomura you talked about uh, the advantages of uh, flex fuel 
and the way the sales have surged up in brazil in flex fuel motorcycles i'm sure there are very key learnings out of those experiences the kind of hardware changes you had to do the kind of uh, material changes that you had to do so definitely this was possible only when you had an integrated approach of adoption of a flex fuel vehicle uh, program development which not only included identification of right material right hardware but also the right kind of uh, after sales mechanisms and the kind of problems that will be uh, there in the vehicles uh, which will be buying especially two wheelers uh, in uh, brazil mr osborne talked about the advantages and challenges which a vehicle manufacturer and engine manufacturer need to uh, consider while developing ethanol based economies ethanol based vehicles mr ratilio uh, siani talked about that the uh, after treatment technology cannot be ignored so the uh, right after treatment technology for ethanol based vehicles whether it is e5 e10 e20 or e85 the right kind of after treatment technology need to be developed there are additional challenges that are there uh, with respect to the precious metals which are being used in the after treatment technologies uh, both uh, in terms of price and the availability Mr. Paul Cost uh, talked about the uh, challenges uh, uh, which uh, manufacturers should consider while developing ethanol-based vehicles. Uh, you touched upon a very important uh, point that is electrification should not be missed. So the advantages of hybridization of ethanol vehicles is something which is a very good uh, key takeaway from this session. Mr. Krishnan, you talked about sustainability of energy solutions in transportation sector. Very rightly said that we have to consider, as I said, uh, what are the uh, energy sources available for, and each country should develop their energy policy based on the resources that are available locally, so that we are really independent of uh, energy uh, reliability. So we have to be self-sustainable. We have to be self-reliant in terms of energy policy for the country. Mr. Krishnan, thank you so much for chairing this uh, and moderating this session. Uh, it was a very, very long session. On behalf of ICAT, I would like to thank all of you for uh, you know being so actively participating in and Mr. Krishnan uh, organizing the whole session in such a great way. And thanks to the team, Enoch, Vikas, Vibhu, Sogata, Abhijit, who were at the back end of the whole organizing of this webinar and uh, making sure that whatever hurdles we met during the day uh, were taken care of uh, simultaneously. Once again, a very uh, uh, thanks, thanks to all of you for being present today uh, and sharing your thoughts uh, in spite of your busy schedules. And I'm sure that a lot of uh, learnings will be there available because of this uh, webinar. The uh, webinar recording will be posted on, along with the papers which have been presented on our Aspire portal, so it will be accessible. We will be preparing some uh, learnings out of it and submitting to ministry for their consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.